Hello and welcome to our game here this Monday morning. I can see the smoke on Michael Verney's face already as we get ready to talk about all the hurling football from the weekend. We're going to have Nicky Brennan on the show soon. We're also going to have John O'Mahony on to talk uh, Gaelic football. A reminder, we're brought to you by OrgaRetro.com. If you want to get a jersey like this, beautiful Limerick one, like that gorgeous Cork or Galway number there, any of the other ones in the range, I'll just display them on the screen here. Just go to orgaretro.com, use the promo code our game, and you'll get 15% off. Do you know when I came out of Parky Cleave uh, last Sunday after Cork had been handed their backsides against Limerick, a Rebel supporter came over to me and said, Shane, don't do a show tomorrow. And uh, I kind of know, <laughs> I know what he's talking about now after Tipperary were pasted by Clare. Yeah, you kind of, some with, with the way the championship is, you kind of need to not lose the run of yourself from one week to the next because you go from almost leaving Park and Cueve smug at your bitter rivals falling to a week later you being the one uh, that got your, your ass handed to you and with your tail, leaving with your tail between your legs but yeah um, another really really interesting weekend I, I can't imagine from a tip point of view I'd say things are, are fairly low this morning because geez that's it's one of the lowest days from a tip point of view that I can remember uh, in quite some time, a really limp display. And when you're looking at, I think that the goods about seven points scored a half time or something like that. And you're just thinking, just, just like the, it was the Red Sea opened up a couple of times in defence. It was mad, really, really strange to see how just how disjointed they were. And I'm sure we're going to go into it here now. But Claire absolutely parachuted themselves into Munster. Looks like Tipperary have probably gone the other way and they're under big pressure with the All-Ireland Champions up next as well. Eight days into the All-Ireland Championship, the Hurling Championship, whatever way you want to look at it, Tipperary are more or less gone. It's April, April 24th yesterday and Tipperary are more or less gone. It would, it, you'd have to be fairly... Would you have to be crazy to be looking at the next couple of fixtures away to Limerick and then home to Cork to be thinking, yeah, the Premier can get back into this. Now... We don't want to make this just about Tipperary. Clare were absolutely brilliant. And I'm just looking at the match programme again and I'm thinking, how many lads stepped up? And then thinking, geez, can they get Mark Rogers back? Can they get Aidan McCarthy back? I mean, I'm not sure what the situation is with, with a couple of those guys. Shane Meehan had to be withdrawn from the from the panel the morning of the game, as far as I know. Um, there was another player who didn't start either. Uh, well, through injuries and stuff like that. They are down a number of players. It's starting to look pretty exciting if you're a banner supporter. So we just focus on them for a minute without making mm. this the Tipperary hijack. <laughs> yeah, I to be fair, just when you're talking there, this is one of the best team performances I can remember. You know, it's a Limerick-esque in that way, in that it's not one or two lads stepping up. This was a brilliant team performance. Even, you know, lads that came in even made a big difference. Shane O'Donnell hadn't played, uh, hadn't played a championship game since the All-Ireland quarterfinal two years ago. Absolutely brilliant. Um, I love that mug, by the way. I never thought my face or half my face would ever be on a mug. But O'Donnell, going on sale soon. Yeah, going on yeah, sale soon. That's the job. O'Donnell was brilliant. Um, the hang time for that catch at the end, two brilliant points. But his his interplay as well and his ability to link play for the couple of goals was class. Like he's not, he wasn't in around the goals yesterday, but he was still able to sense a goal from eighty yards out, which I absolutely loved. Um, Peter Duggan, just an uh, like a, a real nuisance, just a real nuisance. Even uh, I know it was mentioned on commentary how much he was looking for freeze, how much he was protesting at referees. He was just mad up for that yesterday, and was just a real kind of physical torn uh, in Tipperary side. Uh, even like young Robin Mouncy, I thought was brilliant, particularly in the, you know, maybe a tough enough kind of first half, really got into it uh, in the second half and you know, things are looking fairly rosy in the in the Banner Garden at the moment and just again, like, I know Shane O'Donnell got the, the Man of the Match award on the TV, which was um, probably a, a, a hometown decision, shall we say, or clouded a small bit by the fact that he hadn't played in a while but John Conlon, for a guy who hasn't played centre-back like for the vast majority of his career he was just brilliant again yesterday and he had the the attacking instincts as well, not just for the goal, but every time he gets a ball, he's thinking, how can I break the line here? How can I get clear on the front foot? Um, it, it probably won't be talked about too much, but McInerney's kind of instinctive point 
from the sideline as well. It's just outrageous. Um, I know, I know Derek Lynch is probably watching in every time Tipperary were talked about or this fixture were talked about last year. He's like, oh yeah, oh, Claire are actually showing up in Semple Stadium at the weekend. They, they will have a team. And I saw a lot of, a lot of banner folk got a lot of joy out of that yesterday. I think before the 2018 fixture was it, Claire had never won in Semple Stadium. And now four years later, They've done so again, and just it was just how emphatic it was yesterday. Just a brilliant, brilliant team performance. Will we leave it there? So, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, like I was doing, you know, different stats, and you're always looking at different angles to sort of sum up the difference between the two teams. And over the course of the game, the Tipperary starting forwards got three points from play. So that was one for Noel McGrath, one for Michael Breen, one for Mark Kyo. The Tipperary back or the Clare backs got three points from play. Yeah. Through Rory Hayes, David McInerney, and Dermot Ryan. Claire played like men in this game. In terms of like winning rock ball and the dirty ball and coming out with it when it really matters, body on the line. There's they're co- they're coached quite well. They're winning the ball, they're throwing it out the back door, they're moving it forward. They're a modern iteration of a team. Now they were under pressure at the start of the second half. Like Jerry Brown got a great goal. I said to you before, this lad has the skills to be as good as he wants. And he kind of showed it up a little bit there. Solo through the middle, fired it into the top corner. Just a lovely striker of the ball. Actually, his flowing strike reminds me a bit of Pa Burke, but on the other side. Um, but Tipperary had five wides around that, you know, yeah. in more or less in a row. So any opportunity of coming back from 13 points behind was never going to happen. But I have to say, I really admired the where Claire's physicality throughout the game, the way players made sure they got into the game. Like, not everybody had a brilliant 70 minutes. And I don't think that performance from Clare is going to be good enough to get them out of Munster. Tipperary were very poor. I mean, and we sum it up in a lot of different ways, but I still don't know if that would necessarily be good enough for, for Clare to beat Cork. I know Cork were woeful against Limerick uh, to beat Waterford, to beat, um, uh, to, to win their other game as well. Limerick, obviously, Jesus Christ, Limerick. But you know, on Thursday's show, I spoke with Kieran Carey and Richie Power, who are on every Thursday on patreon.com forward slash our game, fully worth uh, signing up for that. But here's a little clip of Richie Power before the game and what he had to say about Tipperary. Tip have probably played their hand, whereas Clare are still holding on to their hand. Um, and that has to be a, that has to be an added bonus and an added uh, you know advantage going into the game. But like as Kiran said, I think if Tip can the likes of Breen and and Jake Morris in particular, like we saw last year flashes of brilliance from Fla- Jake Morris with goals during games. But for me, he goes hiding in games too much. You know, he'll, he'll come with th- this flash of brilliance and then you don't see him for 20 minutes. But if he can, you know, do that, is Bonner Mar fit enough to start? Do you know, ball winner on the half forward line, which which they probably lacked last last week. Um, and Noel McGrath, again, you know, Noel is, is, is Noel, you know, very, very cute, gets himself into good positions, pops over, you know, scores. And for me, I think they need a massive game with Jason Ford. You know, I, I think... You know, he's been a real leader from during the league. But again, I just feel when, when, when it comes to the, the nitty gritty and the hard, you know, the hard yards and championship, Jason is one of these guys that tends to, to slip away. So, you know, if these guys can step up on Sunday, um, you know, no matter what Clare bring, it gives Tipperary a savage chance. And what better way to be going into a championship game with your, with your championship life on the line? Because... Well, look, I mean, I think Richie called it there. Too many of the Tipperary forwards didn't, well, too many of the Tipperary players in general didn't really show up. I've kind of said to you throughout this that I'm concerned about the position of certain players, the way they try to move the ball out from the back. They seem like a team that's kind of stuck in the mud in terms of like, yeah, I mean, Craig Morgan will happily take the ball and run it out time after time, but there's no one on his shoulder. And, you know, we talked about it last week when Sean O'Donoghue got turned over for um, Kyle Hayes to feed Aaron Gallant for that goal down in Parky Cueve. There were no options. I mean, there was lads standing there prone with nobody actually kind of on the run, on the shoulder, peeling off into space. Now, there maybe was one and he maybe missed it because you're solo and you're trying to keep your eye on the ball at the same time. But like Morgan got turned over at one stage. There was no one running off his shoulder. Like you see Limerick with the four men and the full back line and other teams are doing that as well for the short puck out. But somebody's come and taking the ball and someone else is coming at an angle. I mean, you can see how well coached they are. And I look at Tipperary's under 20s in the last couple of weeks, in a short space of time, they're probably moving the ball through the lines a little bit better than the, the Tipperary seniors are. Now, obviously, I know that when you're over the under-20 team, 
you and every other manager has probably only had those players for a preseason or a year or two at best. So it's very different trying to prepare a team for that versus trying to prepare for a clear team that's in year year three and they're all adults and all that kind of stuff. But like so few Tipperary players come away with any credit from this game. Barrett and, and, and Morgan, I'd say, were, were, were two that would. And Seamus Fun- Kennedy. Seamus, Seamus Kennedy, Kennedy shut yeah. down Tony Kelly as much as anyone can. I thought that yeah. was really impressive. But, you know, you just wonder what what's going on in terms of coaching. Because, you know, so, some of the backroom are involved for a couple of years here. In terms of players, you know, what are they demanding in the dressing room? I know there's big player turnover. And we have to be fair to Colin Bonner and say, you're down an awful lot of players. In terms of, like, you know, Paddy Maher's not there. Brendan Maher's not there. Seamus Callanan's not there. Obviously, with injured. John Bubbles O'Dwyer is not there. These are all sort of generational type players for Tip. Brian O'Mara, when we saw him with UL, you're like, okay, he's a guy who'd be obviously stepping into this fray. He's heading away to America, as is Kieran Connolly, who looked like a good midfield option. These are lads with energy. Uh, Niall O'Mara's not there this year. So if we wanted to be fair to Colin Bonner, we'd say, you know, this is what you're inheriting. And a lot of these younger players are 22 or 23 now, and they're only getting their debut. So, you know, you kind of have to be fair to Colin Bonner, too, and say he's been handed a difficult, a difficult hand, really. He's been he's been definitely handed a difficult deck to work with, mm. but you definitely say it, you know it really looks like there's. A, I know Eddie Brennan said it in the end of this morning. There is a bit of an, an identity crisis with what way they're trying to play, and I have to say, uh, one player that I particularly think is. Uh, getting lost in the identity crisis is, is Rona Maher because it, it it at times it doesn't look like it doesn't look like he's playing on instinct at times it looks like he's been programmed a small bit. Um, well, he should be full back, I think, because um, and you know I, I can see all the merit of centre back and all and and all that kind of stuff, but like the Clare puckouts were landing inside the D in the first yeah. half and like James Quigley is a good competitor and he's in his first season, so you can't ask him to be lording it in the tip defence. But he's not the same height or as good in the air as maybe Peter Duggan. So he's going up, maybe reaching with the one hand to try and bat the ball to get something on it and hope that somebody else wins the ruck, which is not happening with Tipperary at the moment. But if you're putting high ball down on Ronan Maher, best of luck to you. He's going to be catching him. Tip, or mm. Kenny found that out in the 2019 all Ireland final. You do not hit long ball on him. So that's why I would have thought, put him full back. And Tip have the world of options for half back. You put Barry Heffernan in there, you can... You can move Dylan Quirk to midfield. You could bring in Paddy Cadell. You know, there, there's lots of different options. But, like, your square has to be secure, Mike. Oh, 100%. Ash, yeah, sure. it's, so, it's so important. And as well as that, um, I don't know, you could probably see it because you were down in, down in Semple. Like, the tip off half-back line, Seamus Kendi had to follow and his instructions were to follow. So it's okay, I think, for that wing to be vacated somewhat when he's following Tony Kelly. But the fact that there was no half back line in sight for John Conlon's shot, like imagine to say you break the line and there's forty to fifty yards in front of you, it was I, I couldn't believe it looking at it. it was was crazy this John Conlon's ten steps before he had the shot? <laughs> well, yeah, well that's true too. Yeah, uh, once you throw a sidestep, you seem to get it. You seem to get away with it. But the fact that Brian Hogan made a good save. And there was nobody there waiting for the rebound. The forward was just, you know, Ian Galvin. And I have to say, his instinct was to pull. His instinct was definitely to yeah. pull. And you could see, and he just checked himself, took the ball on. Probably, you know, going back to that Aaron Shanahan moment against Galway a couple of years ago, when maybe he could have taken a touch and put it into the net. It's probably something collect- collectively they've maybe learned from. But even Peter Duggan's shot, or uh, the, yeah, the Conlon shot, that Duggan had so much time just standing by himself at the edge of the square. And the fact that there was a three on two for, uh, there was a three on two for Conlon's shot, was it was really, really strange to see that uh, in a championship game. Just a couple of quick things I want to throw to you, Shane. Just uh, Eddie Brennan had a, had a bit of a cut probably this morning. I'm sure a lot of people had a cut. But he just said uh, a couple of lines from, said, your home has to be a fortress, but Tip got bullied in their own backyard. And, you know, they definitely looked like they got bullied all over the pitch. They looked like a lame deer, an identity crisis. He said they don't know what they're, uh, whether they're trying to play a classic Tip style or whether they're morphing into a modern style. And I do think that's a big, a big problem. What way are they trying to play? They're trying to make, I don't know what, like in the second half, it was just long ball it looked like to me so it was very very hard from your point of view like what way are they trying to play what are they trying to do Every, like do you know why Limerick are so good because of the marginal gains we're going to talk about the scores they got from sidelines at some point the, um, just even the way they set up from puck outs the pockets of space they create the way they run it out from the back and the stats we had last Thursday that uh, that Sean Flynn had done in terms of like when they go short the percentage of short puck outs 
that resulted up in possession in the op uh, opposition half of the field. All of these things Tipperary aren't doing. Actually, I'll just show you here. This was Limerick last week against Cork. 18 short puckouts, 13 of them resulted in possession in the off uh, opposite half of the field. Whereas look at Tipperary there, it's, it's a third, and that was against Waterford. I don't have the stats for, for the game at the weekend yesterday. It's just been too short of a turnaround. But I, I look at all the different things, and I'm like, how does, you know, how do Clare end up getting a penalty for Brian McGrath, who just come on the field uh, pulling at um, Peter Duggan? I mean, number one, obviously, as a defender, you never make it obvious that you're pulling the jersey. But by God, you're definitely pulling the jersey. Or at very minimum, you're digging a lad into the back to make sure he can't get near. Rona Maher is standing and he's watching. When, you know, the goalkeeper, like this, the goalkeeper needs to be the guy directing this. This is completely down to the goalkeeper. He needs to be saying, hold that man out. Hold it out. I remember this uh, with the uh, UCD Freshers in a game this year. Screaming it at the players right as we were setting up for a sideline cut. Didn't listen, ended up in the back of the net. I'm not saying I'm a great coach or anything like that, but this is just so such a fundamental. Like Brian Hogan needs to be saying to Rona Maher, who stood there and watched as Brian McGrath held uh, Peter Duggan, both he hold him out. And again, if Rona Maher is full back, there's no way he's getting nudged backwards by any player, really. On that so, as well, Shane, if Rona Maher slips back on Duggan for, for that for that free, it makes more sense as well. It makes more sense to have him. Uh, it just in case it does drop in high, it makes more sense but to he's have beside him. him and he, he, you yeah. know, he's beside him and he's just kind of like a bystander. But then mm. another thing, um, the, the use of the ball, like so... Tipperary won a number of frees in their own half and their own 65. By the way, we're bringing on Nicky Brennan just in a second now. But the amount of times where they could have hit a, a quick free into 60 yards of space of a 2v2, which was sometimes Morris and Kyo. And when Kyo ran at Conor Cleary, he was in a bit of bother. Yeah. This was in the first half, the, the two boys were inside. But they just stood, stood around, waited, 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 and then someone blasted a free wide from 90 yards. Get quick ball into Mark Kyo when there's space. He's going to do damage. Like we've seen it in game after game. Um, I'll bring in Nicky Brennan here. Nicky, delighted to have you on the show. Sorry, I kept you in the background there for a second or two. How are you this morning? I'm good. I was enjoying listening to the two of you there, having a little banter there. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, Nicky, drive the boot into me and, uh, and Tipperary. What did you make of that performance? Or do you want to celebrate Claire's great win? I think it's probably more the latter, to be honest about it. Uh, um, Claire were very good and uh, they came into the game in fairness. What they had no game beforehand. Tip had the game with Waterford. Yeah, they were down a bit in the dumps about that. But Clare was the team that came out really out of the blocks fast. And I think that was probably the most important thing. They came out of the blocks fast, had three goals goals got before half time, and were asking big questions of Tipperary, which Tipperary could not answer. And while Ger Brown's goal gave a little hope to the Tipperary supporters, they really were playing second fiddle. Look at I think it's a case of Tipper coming off of having had a very good team and recreating a new strong team again is simply going to take time. It happens with the best of counties. You've seen it with my own. You've seen it with other counties as well, Cork over the years. It does take time. There's not an instant flow of talent there, despite what they've had with under-21 and minor and that. And Tipperary are on a, a rebuilding pro pro process at this stage. And I'm telling you that... Um, um, Lone, the, the player coach, Brian Lone is a very astute coach. I've been watching him very closely and he's able to get a lot out of his players. But the big bonus for Clare was that they had Shane O'Donnell and Peter Duggan back and they look very eager. They look very, fr they're very fresh for obvious reasons and they look very eager and bringing those two guys into your attack was a real bonus. The big question was, how would they return after their long period out of the game? Because if you're on for 12 months and, and not playing at a real competitive level, it's not that easy to get back to the inter-county scene. You might get on OK with the club, but it, they were a real, real bonus. And uh, they delivered big games yesterday. And once they were doing that, Chip were going to be in a bit of bother. But I think Michael referred to, or one of you, Shane, maybe referred to the fact that Tip got so little scores from play. I would have seen Jason Ford as one of the best forwards in the game for the last couple of years. But he did not get any score from play uh, yesterday for Tipperary and when that's happening you're under pressure because he is your go-to player on any team if your go-to forward is not scoring then your team is going to be in a bit of bother and it is going to take time for some of those younger players to try and bed down now there's some of them being taken off and being put back in the game so there's a confidence question developing here so this is this is going to put a lot of pressure on uh, Colin Bonner and I don't know about the absence of uh, Tommy Dunn as well from the whole scene what that's going to mean to it as well so they're in a bit of bother, and of all the places to go when you're in a bit of bother, is down to play Limerick. So they have big, big, uh, big, big issues. This could be a very short uh, season. 
Yeah, it does. It does. Very... Yeah. It looks like a very short season, all right. And it just people that are pining probably for the fact that a couple of big teams may be gone early. Like you have to remember back in the 90s, 80s, 70s, and God knows how long back, teams were gone. Teams were gone after one game. At least they're getting four games and they might be gone. So you don't really have any excuses. Just to piggyback on something Nicky said there as well. How nice of a position is it for Brian Lowen to be in to know that? Tipperary can or they can give Tipperary a hiding and Tony Kelly is quiet. The fact that um it's not like it was never a one man show, but to know that even if uh, the opposition team puts their best man marker on Tony and he's kept relatively quiet, they have loads of other options that can explode into a game. And the fact that O'Donnell has more space to operate on if Kelly has been really shackled like that, Duggan has more space to operate in as well. Uh, it mightn't be necessarily that Tony Kelly's going to hit 212 now in every game, but other guys, they have that class now where other guys can contribute and win games. And even if Kelly's not doing it on the scoreboard, he's still doing a real service for the team by, I suppose, taking so much attention on him and leaving some space and that to, for other players to operate on. So I think they're laughing uh, going into the next couple of games. Yeah, well, of course. I mean, Tony Kelly was always going to be the go-to person yesterday. and But as I said earlier, no one knew. And I'd say even Brian Lowen was not sure when the ball was thrown in, in, the, in over the line in Turles how Peter Duggan and Shane O'Donnell were going to get on. And he must have been absolutely thrilled at the way they played. And yes, uh, Tony Kelly may not have had the prominent game, but he was always a threat. He was always at least having one Tipperary defender keeping an eye on him. He was still looking for the ball. And I think, uh, yeah, Brian Lawn will be will be very happy. But he'll also be he'll also realise it's their first game in the championship and have a couple of strong games coming up. So he won't be counting his chicken jet, and, and, you know, at this stage. And uh, I mean, the the manager under the most pressure is clearly Colin Bonner because he has to go to Limerick next weekend and another defeat. Really, that's it. Yeah, it certainly is. I'll go through some of the comments here. Grodo Gracon says, uh, main takeaways, Wexford never seem to be able to take advantage of when they're a man up. They should have scope for improvement. If they do meet Limerick two more times, they will win at least one. Delighted for Clare. If we can get Meehan and Shanahar back for other Munster games and get out of Munster, we may be able to have Reedy, Mark Rogers and Aidan McCarthy back at some stage. Uh, Adrian McGrath says that Clare were badly beaten on the ground in the half forward line in the first 20 minutes of the second half, especially after puck outs. Tough cornerback adds, O'Donnell adds so much athleticism to the middle third for Clare. His great speed and guile in his running style topped off with his intelligence in distribution. Actually, do you know what? One thing I, I was thinking, last year when we saw, or the previous year when we saw Shane O'Donnell in the half forward line, uh, Michael, we were questioning whether you could, whether you would massively miss him from the inside line because he's such a danger in there. I remember one game against, I think, Leash in the qualifiers when they struggled to get past him. But now, like, and he is that bit bulked up, but the, the ability to actually burst, break through the line from the half forward line. You know, he, he got a point in the first half. Obviously, I think he put away um, John Conlon. He set him free for that that other time. And actually, by the way, both of those puck outs, both, both of those goals that Claire got in the first half came off Tipperary not being able to mm. win their own puck outs. They were fairly hopeless with them. But uh, being able to have Shane O'Donnell in the half forward line now was a great option. Yeah, as well as that, Shane, sometimes when like O'Donnell's basically, play, basically been playing inside since the 2013 All-Ireland final replay, and uh, no more than, let's say, Keane Lynch starting as an inside forward and coming out or whatever, it's just something different. It, it can become, um, you're very easy to analyse, maybe maybe easy to know what he's going to do if he gets the ball inside he's going to get the ball he's going to take you on whereas as a half forward now we wouldn't have predicted that he's going to be winning puck outs we probably don't know what he's going to do out there that's why you know you know even the couple of little stick passes been more of a creator now than a finisher uh, it, it just it's a bit of a fly in the ointment for teams they don't really know what to expect from him and like he was just really good at creating yesterday and but it, it's it's needs must really he was inside for so long probably because they they didn't have many of those guys that can play inside now you're looking at you're thinking when Shane Meehan is fit he's there when Aaron Shannon is fit he's there um, they're missing as you say David Reedy so maybe they need like an O'Donnell player out there, but Jesus, when you were going through the options, if they can get everybody fit and get Aidan McCarthy back on the pitch, um, yeah, Jesus, they're in a really, really good position going into that. That car game is obviously a huge game now. Will will maybe essentially decide that third spot if they can get a result from that game. They're in a really, really good spot. Well, I suppose the thing is, as I said at the start, it's not to probably run away with yourself too much. 
too early because um, Tipperary optimism was probably really high after the Walsh Park game. Now it's, you know, maybe at an all-time low. So Clare people, even though they might not want it, they probably need to try and stay level at the moment because uh, your fortunes can turn very quick in this round-robin cam- campaign. It feels like you're saying to me that a four-point defeat to Watford went to Tipperary's heads. <laughs> but it's kind of kind of like that. I think people ran away with it. And a lot of that was to do with, yeah, Tipperary played well down there. But there was probably a bit of a hangover from the league final, I'd say, with Watford. Um, maybe a tighter pitch. Uh, maybe just that bit of complacency. Not a lot of guys hurled them well, whereas a lot of guys hurled well for Tip. Um and it looks like Tipperary really kind of, not that they showed their hand the first week, but they came with Hellfire and Brimstone the first week and they came with anything but yesterday in their home patch, which as Eddie, Eddie Brennan said in the paper, is really, it's really unacceptable. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting now, Clare, two weeks in a row, they're playing up against, and they're playing against the team with its season on the line, like Richard Barry saying, could see Clare knock Cork out next weekend. Is that, is that a good or a bad thing for Clare that they're playing teams with lives on their line, uh, lives on the line, Nicky? Well, it probably is, but I think what's more important, it's ironic that they go back to play Cork in Temple Stadium next Sunday. Now, I think that's a, that's a bonus from Clare's perspective, and uh, I'm afraid, you know, Cork supporters mightn't be having too many nice things to say about Ed Sheeran, but the reality of it is, <laughs> is that, you know, I know Cork like generally and Cork supporters like going to Turles, but for Clare having played a good game, a really good game against Tipperary there yesterday, uh, yesterday, now they're back up a week later, I think Brian Lawn would be absolutely delighted to be heading back to Thurles. But look, there's a lot on the line for Cork here. I mean, Cork are just, they're a bit unpredictable because we don't know how they're going to set up. We know that they have, they have some key decisions to make about central defensive positions, for example. They have key decisions to be made about how they're actually going to play the game because their puck out strategy and they're trying to get the ball through the lines was not working simply because the players themselves were not working around the field to give enough options to the player in possession. So I'm sure that will have exercised Kieran Kingston and his colleagues' minds over the past week and, and a half because they've had time now to reflect on, on what's going to happen. They've seen Clare play yesterday and they'll obviously be in the next day or two, they'll be working out what best tactics might be deployed. But they, they know that they're up against a team now that's uh, that's bang in form, have a couple of players to come back and Cork are they'll be disappointed uh, at the manner of their defeat the last day, mainly because they could not execute what they had hoped would they would be what could, could deliver them a victory, but they were well out of it against uh, against Limerick, and uh, they're going to find it challenging against Clare. But I wouldn't dismiss Cork. They have the ability to come back. And they still have plenty of good players if they just get the tactics right, and if they also allow the players to express themselves in their own way and not have them so bloody programmed that once you get the ball, you all you have to turn around and almost face your own goalie. When you see when you see any defender having to turn around and face his own goal. You know you haven't been bothered. Just when Nicky is talking there, Shane, I just seen it. Obviously, he's talking about Kieran Kingston. I'm sure he was in Turles yesterday. And said, like, John Kiley, yeah, John Kiley was there as well. Just thinking, I'd say there is some man hours been put in behind the scenes from week to week to week, getting preparing for this game, getting intel on the next game. Kiley goes from you know an evening game in the Gaelic grounds. He's up straight away Sunday morning. He's getting updates on all his players. He's going to Semple Stadium. He's getting further updates on his players. He's getting training ready for the next week. I'd say the man hours going in behind the scenes whatever about players and their preparation I'd love to know uh, uh, I'd say between being a principal of a school in the Abbey and getting your work done with, with Limerick I'd say I'd say three or four hours sleep a night and planning God only knows the amount of planning that's going on behind the scenes because it's such a wham bam thank you ma'am championship you have to be you're looking at this game then all of a sudden you know ten minutes after the, the final whistle you're immediately looking at the next game you're getting intel on your opposition it's uh, it's really, really demanding on everybody involved. He should try try doing a Monday morning show where he's also talking about Gaelic <laughs> football. True, yeah, 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 but I, I would say, Michael, these managers know well in advance. They know what was going to land on top of them in this new condensed championship. So it is already pre-planned. Every one of John Kiley's team, I think, they know precisely what they have to do. They know when they have to deliver whatever he's looking for at a particular time. And I think all of that is done. So, so while you're right, it is very condensed and it is very hectic. A good organised manager, and, and you have to be that as well off the field as on the field, will be able to get all of the data he requires. And also, you don't have too much data overload as well, because I, I just can't understand this tactic. 
see guys coming out with white boards and uh, at half time matches or whatever it might be. The players are not able to condense just all of that or take on con- get in board into their heads all of that. You can confuse them as well. And I keep saying we need to be very careful. We don't stymie that the really good hur- hurlers or footballers, for that matter, to express themselves in the way they can and have them so programmed that they're just confused what to do next. You know, after the game, I was over talking to Brian Lohan and uh, Colin Bonner. It's where Brian Lohan, you know, had just been beaten by 25 points. He was keeping it that low key. It was kind of brilliant and impressive the way he did it. And, you know, he was like, you know, you know, Shane O'Donnell did well, Peter Duggan did well. And he's like, yeah, no, great to have them back. And just the, his tone, it really would swear they had just lost. Whereas, you know, Colin Bonner is a very difficult spot for him. And, you know, when he was asked what are Tipperary trying to do, you know, in terms of how they're trying to play, he said, when it looks good in training, it looks awesome. And I think we can beat anyone. And then you can get thrown back like that. So it's going to test the character of this team and it's going to test the development. As I said, we're building people, we're building players like this and we're uh, trying to build this team. And then he was asked about Limerick next and he goes, uh, they're the All-Ireland champions, Munster champions, and you're heading into the Gaelic grounds. And when Limerick have the upper hand on tip, they're not going to let us go down. Uh, so they're going to battle it out and bring a good game. Look, it's all about building this team, building leaders, building players, letting them build these bonds and connectivities that you need when you're on the field, when you're fighting for your life. These players were fighting for their life. Did they play like a team that was fighting for their life, Nicky? Temporary. Yeah. Yeah, look, at Tipperary are in a difficult spot now. Look, at the, look Shane, you know what the score was at halftime? Clare had scored three goals. So the big doubts were setting in at that stage and Tipperary were on the back foot. Any manager that's gone into a second half, knowing that his players have been completely out in the first half, knowing that they have a mountain to climb, is going to be a difficult position. Clearly, there was plenty of pain taken off the ball in Simple Stadium, I'm sure, at half time by Colin Bonner and his, and his fellow selectors and trying to get the players. Now, when Ger Brown got that goal, and if there is a cause for concern for Clare, it was the way that Ger Brown did race through that defence because there are plenty of speedy players on the Limerick team and on, and on, and on other teams as well. Uh, that that could and that's something for Cork to watch out for. Uh, at the at the Cork will be, be very good at. They have a lightning pace in their attack, so that Jer Brown goal might very well be an indication of things to come if uh, if Clare are not careful about it. But obviously they were not. They simply weren't playing good enough. I mean, as we said at the start, the number of scores that Tipperary got from play was indicative of the overall way that the team played, and it was very difficult. No matter, unfortunately, from Colin Bonner's point of view, he will have sat on the line. He knew he played a lot of his hand. He took off. He brought on about six subs at various stages. Jake Morris was taken off in the 49th minute. And he would have been seen as one of their main goal to players. Uh, in attack, he's been there for a couple of years now. And he was left in that position where he had to make those changes. So it was just difficult for Tipperary, really, in the second half. And Clare, Clare are a team, when they get going, when they get confidence, when they get momentum, they can be very difficult uh, to, to halt. I, I've seen them over the years. And the last time I saw him in person was in a, a league match down against Kilkenny. And their, their movement off the ball, and, and they were excellent. And I was very impressed by them. That was last year. Uh, so I'm, I'm not surprised that they're making progress this year. And now with Duggan and O'Donnell back, they're in a very, very good position. And I think when Limerick go to Ennis, I tell you one thing, that, that's not a gimme for Limerick. I mark my words. They may win all their other games, but that could be one that they might have, they might have a difficulty with. Yeah, and just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgaretro.com. Use the promo code our game, you'll get 15% off. Kev Kyo, Saturday, Munster Hurling Snobs. There's no handy games in Munster. Sunday, Tipperary, hold my beer. So we'll, we'll move on a little bit from that and talk about uh, Limerick's brilliant win. I mean, obviously, I caused a little bit of a ruckus on uh, Saturday night when I was tweeting that um, this is a significant failure from Watford to not beat a Limerick team so weakened by absences. That's not to say that they can't come back from it, but it can't be passed off either. Defiance from the treaty. So the context of that is that we didn't have Seamus Flanagan going into this game, an all-star, Peter Casey, an all-star, Kyle Hayes, you know, one of the best young hurlers in the country and probably arguably the best athlete. And then obviously, you know, Keen Lynch went off after about 10 minutes of the game. And by God, was there fits of the vapours taken there as if I was insulting Watford as a county. Uh, Nikki, I'll just start off with you. <coughs> You, well, I start off with you, so um, Michael. Like, was this a significant failure in terms of like this is a team with aspirations of winning All Ireland, and they couldn't beat quite a weakened Limerick team by their standards? Yeah, I uh, I didn't get to see this game live on Saturday, so I was taking the score score in at the end. I'm taking two twenty one to thirty points, and I was looking at, oh, this is really really good from Watford. You know, eleven points defeats in the last two years down to three. 
And then you go and look at the game back and you get the context of it and you see Keane Lynch went off so early. Um, they had themselves in a really, really good position. And then all of a sudden it was like an arm wrestle and it just Limerick just kept down, 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 down like that. And they were just able to, when the game looked like it was there to, to be won, that's kind of maybe 50 to 65 minutes. Limerick were just grinding them out, grinding them out. And it was just amazing to see the the hunger and appetite from Limerick players, the amount of bodies that were getting in around, especially in around that middle third. It was basically the whole team, bar bar Nicky Quaid and maybe bar Aaron Galan and sometimes Graham Mulcahy. They just really, really ground down Waterford. And, you know, part of me does agree with what you say there. If Waterford can't get a, a victory over Limerick when all those players are missing, when, you know, when they lose the hurler of the year in game and have to adapt to that in game, um, I think Waterford would have learned a lot. And even yesterday, uh, or even looking at the game on Saturday, they did physically front up and they did get a lot of bodies in. There were a lot of similarities, we'd say, with the you know with how the two teams play. But it will have been disappointing. Did the goals paint a you know an unfair picture even on how the game actually panned out? Because it looked like probably at one stage that Limerick were maybe going to win by eight to ten, uh, only for Waterford to kind of hit them with a. Uh, I wouldn't say sucker punches, but that f- that free is probably an unlikely score in mo- in modern day hurling now. Then they worked the second goal absolutely brilliant, lovely crisp ball through the hands. But I'd say Liam Cahill would be not scratching his head, but he will find it hard to believe maybe how they were in such a good position in the game and then managed to be basically you know momentum and everything was just wrestled away from them. So. It's kind of caught between two stools. They narrowed the gap. They showed that they can take maybe Limerick down the stretch, but they also potentially missed an opportunity to psychologically just have them get one up on Limerick and know that, like, part of me thinks, if Limerick were missing all these players, if I'm a Waterford player, Limerick were missing all these players and we still weren't able to take advantage, when all these players come back, does that have a, a mental impact on us? And we're thinking, Jesus, we're going to be really up against it now when we play them with, with, with a full deck. So it's probably a tricky one from a Waterford point of view. And it's not a given, it's not a given that they're going to that they're going to get out of Munster. You know, they have obstacles to get overcome, they have games to win. You expect them to, but it'll be interesting to see how they react to potentially maybe a game that they would feel that they could have won at the weekend. I'm going to give a small bit of context and throw it to you then, Nicky. First off, Kev Kios is concerning that Stephen Bennett has no scores from playing the championship this year. Like the last 20 minutes, from the 49 minutes onwards, the, the scores that Watford got, a free from Stephen Bennett, a wide from Shane McNulty from midfield. They had a wide that was actually a pass from Jake Prendergast. They had a wide that was um, a free from, from uh, Austin Gleeson, I think, in his own half. They got the two goals, one of which was from uh, a free. The other was a brilliantly worked goal. Then they had a wide from Shane McNulty, corner back again. Then Limerick had the last seven chances of the game. Like, the goals really did paper over the cracks, Nicky. They did, but I would disagree with something you're saying there. I think in relation to Limerick, what we're not given enough credit to is that John Kiley has, over the last couple of years, been working slowly to build up his panel because he was always expecting the day when he would be down a few players. And you've alluded to it, Shane, at the start of this particular segment about the number of players that Limerick are missing. But he has he's brought on a number of players. You know, Cahill O'Neill is there, David Reedy and, and, and Pat Ryan were the players that he actually brought on. But he Connor Boylan started the game. And he's building up them. They're getting more and more experience. And while they're, they may not be in the same category as the players they replaced uh, or the players who are out injured, nevertheless, Kylie has been slowly building up his panel. So I think, to be fair, just because a number of big names are missing, doesn't mean that we should see Limerick as being any weaker. Now, clearly in relation to Watford and uh, that Twitter there, Kev Kyo was spot on. I think the fact that um, Stephen Bennett has not been scoring as much from play at the moment is a big factor for Watford. Now, why is that happening? Maybe the opposition are targeting better. Maybe they're making sure he's not getting the possession or there's more one-to-one in him. I'm not quite sure. But certainly he's not delivering what Watford expect. Of, a, of an outfield player. And their return from Watford overall in the end was small enough. Limerick put on a scoring burst in the second half. And you're right, those two goals, I think Liam Cal will be smart enough to realise that those two goals camouflage a more impressive Limerick win than, than was there at the very end. So he will know that. But at the same time, 
look, they, they probably are getting a little bit closer all the time to them, but in fairness to Limerick, they are showing what a great team they are. They're still physically strong. And it is when you see a guy like Jeremy Burns having such an impact on the game, he is popping over nearly five, six points in every match. Now, that is a huge contrib- contribution from a halfback. And while, while there's some of them from freeze, of course, nevertheless, you know, teams have got to realize if you're if you're committing fouls out that distance, this guy is just uh, deadly from uh, from freeze and he just hits the black spot every time. So teams are going to have to look at all aspects of their play there. But from Warren's perspective, look, I think Liam Carl will have left the Gaelic grounds, you know, saying in one hand, God, we got close enough to him on this occasion. But he's a smart enough guy to realize that those two goals at the end probably camouflaged a more impressive Limerick victory than was actually on the scoreboard at the end of the game. Uh, Michael, when you look at the performance from Limerick, how much of it hinges on Aaron Galan and how much the other team has to concern themselves with him? He obviously started off marking against uh, being marked by Irla Daly, and this was to some degree Liam Cahill was moving his pieces around and he put Conor Prunty out wing back on Groot Hegarty. Now, I thought Prunty was doing okay, but I thought Hegarty was brilliant, especially when Lynch went off. He was showing for those puck outs. He was brilliant against Cork. He's probably the forerunner for hurler of the year already, if we can talk about it this early. But uh, how much of it is down to Aaron Galan? Four different players ended up marking him, and still he got six points from play. Yeah, we've probably talked, Shane. I I think he's always been threatening to be, you know, the elite of the elite. Like, uh, even, you know, his goal, his goal chances hitting low rather than high, increasing his percentages. That look, looks like something that he's, he's worked on, definitely based on the first game. But how good of a sign is it of a player that when he is needed most and has been needed most in the past two games, he stepped up like he's in outrageous form. Um, if he gets the ball in his hand, you just feel like he can score from anywhere. You know that when he gets the ball out in the in the in the right corner and turns back, and he it looks like he's gesturing like he's going to pass the ball, and he just hits it over his shoulder over the bar. Like he was in unstoppable form the other night, and I just think it's a it's a magnificent sign of a player that when Keen Lynch goes off, when Seamus Flanagan's not there. there when Peter Casey's not there that this guy brings his form to a different level and um, he was outstanding the other night and it just he just looks like he's taking the mantle on his shoulders and he just wants that responsibility he wants um, I suppose Limerick is is more of a unit maybe than individual players but he is basically saying give me this pressure give me this expectation I'll deliver and he's definitely delivered so far this year yeah where, where do you rank him now Nicky well, I'm just seeing some tweets coming up there about uh, Galan and and uh, Dermot Burns in uh, in line for hurling of the year. If you're picking them at the moment, there's one up from Liam Lennon there. Yeah, I think that's spot on. I could not disagree with that at all. Look, he's an absolutely fantastic forward. He's able to make space for himself. His ability to drift around the field and not worry about who's marking him. Look, I mean, we're all. I could I could probably make the simple statement: if somebody doesn't man mark him, he's going to continue to do this for the rest of the year. But the danger is when you man mark somebody, and Tony Kelly was a pointing case in our earlier discussion. Man mark the best player; somebody else will jump out of the uh, the pack and uh, be that player for the day. So that's the issue. But if you're if he's it's the movement that's created in the Limerick attack that allows Galan to get that extra yard. And good players like him, they only need half a yard and sight of the goal to pop the ball over the bar. He's deadly accurate. Uh, his conversion rate is fantastic. Uh, and, and that's why it's, uh, it's going to be very difficult. Now, it'll be a big test, as I said, uh, for, for uh, Tipperary and what they're going to do on Sunday. And they will have, they will have seen that uh, they know if they give space to uh, the, the inside attack and Galani uh, particularly, uh, he will punish them uh, hugely. So not easily done. And uh, we can very easily sit here in a chair and say how it should be done. Uh, not easily done when everybody around him is moving as well and he's getting so much support from them. And that's why guys like Galan are able to pop over all these points because they have so much support around them and it's just impossible to keep them down. Look, at they're, they're, they're on a roll these times and Galan is really back to his uh, very, very best. Yeah, I mean, he's he's 25, 26 this year. This lad, uh, you know, he's ha- had a lot of success under his belt. The way he finished the goal the last day against Cork, putting it into the ground, we'd often talked about the high finishes. He's now putting it into the ground. This lad could really dominate in the next few years. But um, he is another example of a Limerick player that seems to be up-coached in the sense that you can see that them gradually improving over the last few years, that this lad has more strings to his bow than he previously did. I mean, this would be a concern I'd have when I look at the likes of Tipperary or when Cork supporters 
uh, look at some of their players, you wonder, is this lad doing the same thing for the last five years, the exact same way, and coming up short the same way? You know, obviously having the same success with the same things, but, you know, losing out the same way too. So that's that's the sort of question I'd have at looking at Limerick versus everyone else. They do so many small things right, and they all add up to uh, a couple of extra points here and there. Nothing was summed that up better than the Roy Orbison tattoo podcaster, um, I think it's called on Twitter, showing the short puck out stats for our short sideline stats for Mike, uh, for, for Limerick compared to everyone else. Michael, do you want to run through that there? Because you sent it to me last night. And you're gone muted Today. there, Michael, I think. Oh, no, you you're hear okay. me now? Yeah. yeah, I just think it's fascinating because it's all to do with efficiency. And this is how Limerick play, be it efficiency in their puckouts, be it efficiency in their tackling, efficiency in their shooting. And I just think sidelines are a really, really interesting one. I, I basically think this is uh, a decision that's been made probably since maybe Darrow Donovan's sideline even in 2019 on Ireland semi-final, that controversial one that uh, should have been a 65 and been a potential leveller. They're basically, I'd say, the only team Kilkenny at times don't uh, don't take on sidelines. Even TJ would maybe like to. Sometimes he doesn't take them on maybe as much as say Waterford will take on a sideline. Jason Ford took on a sideline yesterday. Galway will take on sidelines. Limerick took four sidelines at the weekend, worked them all short, and managed to get three points from it. It's hurling is all about possession now. It's that's why you know ground hurling is gone. That's even why overhead pulling is gone uh, in the game to to some extent. But Limerick use the sideline now as we have the ball at our feet here. How can we hold on to the ball? How can we create a scoring chance? And like you look at it now and Gerard Hegarty's just standing with his arm like that, waiting for someone to make a run and he just pulls it, maybe gives it back to the taker and they take on a point. But to, to be getting to be scoring basically as a result of 75% of your sidelines in attacking positions is fairly outrageous. Compare that to Tipperary, who got one point from their three. That was a Jason Ford line ball over the bar. Uh, Waterford got one point from their two. Dublin got uh, Dublin took what six sidelines and scored. Ended up getting one from them. Um, same with Clare had five, I think, and got nothing from them. And same with Wexford five and got nothing from them. Didn't even get shot. Um, from them, so it just shows you they are like I know Paul Canark is a mathematical genius, so he's literally looking at how do we increase our percentages of getting shots off, getting scores on the board, and they've looked at the short sideline. Um, and it's just it's yet another facet of the game where they're maxing nearly out of what they can what they can make from something, and it's just fascinating to see how they've nearly stacked the percentages in their favors and in all aspects of the game. Yeah, like I think you shouldn't three... underestimate Chain. You shouldn't underestimate Limerick have won two All Ireland. You cannot underestimate the level of confidence that winning All Ireland finals will give to players. Um, you're you're seeing a, a lot of those Tipperary players who played yesterday haven't been that, that successful at senior level. Uh, you'll, you'll see Clare, I suppose, are starting to get a bit more conscious, but the Limerick players are oozing confidence simply because they have been so successful. And, and that, to me, is a big factor. They have they trust one another, they know one another, and that's part of the reason why they're so successful at the moment. But the, in terms of those marginal gains, I know you're talking there, Nicky. In, in terms of those marginal gains... You know, I, I look at Tipperary and winding up with taking a minute to hit a, a long range free and then driving it wide. And, you know, look at what Limerick do to have Jeremy Burns to drive it over the black spot. He's, such, you know, probably even a 90% free taker from, from those distances and doing that with the sidelines and Tipper clipping them wide. I mean, all that stuff really does add up and it comes back to the really good coaching that they have. Uh, look, absolutely. But John Kiley knows. What, what his players are capable of. I mean, they have been worked. These players have been around Limerick now for a number of years before at underage, coming to under 21, being successful. John Kiley knows what these guys are capable of. And he also, look, they've had some challenges over the years. And John Kiley is not just a great coach. He's a great people manager and person manager as well. He's not principal of a large second level school for, for, for no reason at all. Uh, he's, he's huge person management. And his ability to manage the individual players and the players now know very much what Kylie expects of them, and uh, that's why they're delivering, and that's why they're playing with such confidence at the moment. It's a, it, You can go back to the great Kilkenny team of a number of years ago. It was like that they had Cody knew the quality he had in his players. He almost didn't have to coach them because he knew he just had to keep them primed up going into every match. 
And for the most part, they were delivering in most of those games. Kylie is in exactly the same position, maybe a fraction area to compare the two teams. But right now, Limerick are heading in a direction that's not far off the great Kilkenny team. And they, they could very well get up there in the not too distant future. So just to move on to Leinster then, Kilkenny beat Leash 234 to 114. Galway put 337 up uh, to Westmead's 117. Now, I haven't been in the position of GA president and trying to bring through counties. And now Leash were down an awful lot of players for this game. That has to be uh, stated here. Is there this kind of balance between, you know, trying to develop teams that obviously want to bridge that gap between, you know, the second tier and the top tier? versus trying to ensure the integrity of a competition and make sure that games aren't quite as one-sided as this? Well, the current system that's in, obviously, in Leinster and in Munster as well, of course, uh, that's where scoring difference is going to be an issue. You saw Galway on that famous, was it a Saturday or Sunday evening a few years ago in Parnell Park, and we were all glued to our radios to know what the results uh, were, and we saw that Galway were knocked out. So ever since that happened, teams are going to pile on the scores against Leash and Westmead, who are qu quite a distance away from the other four teams in the province. There's no point in saying otherwise. Now, I know Wexford have only one point so far, but Leash were, it was the poorest I saw Leash in a long time. Now, yes, they were down Hodge Delaney, Picky Marr, um, Ross King, just to mention three players, but Leash were very, very poor. And Kilkenny won by 23 points and could have won by a lot more. They hit 18 wides. And we're well, well on top of Leash. So, but Kilkenny are going well now. To be fair, I was, I've been impressed by Kilkenny in their last, well, maybe for the first half against Westmead, but that was the first game of the year, so you caught them a bit of slack. But they were, they were very good last Saturday. Yes, against the poor Leash team, and I know you have to keep that in balance. But I think Cody will be happy enough heading over uh, to Salt Hill. But for Leash, it's obviously going to be a straight dogfight between themselves and Westmead as to know who's going to finish in the last spot. Yeah, but in terms of the competition integrity, well, there is an issue. There's an issue about that, you know. But I mean, I was listening to uh, the Sunday game last night and the talk about about money and investing money. It's not that long ago uh, when Liam O'Neill was president, he he proposed that a million euro be spent on a number of counties. Now, as I, I ended up actually chairing the group in Leinster that involved uh, Carlo, Leash, Westmeath, and Offaly, and they got two hundred thousand euro over a period of five years. Now, Antrim got it as well, uh, and that money was invested in, it wasn't just a check handed to the county board, it was invested in how we could, the principle behind it was, how can we get those counties up to a level of preparation that the tier one counties are doing? Because bear in mind, you had Carlo players in Carlo IT with Kilkenny players, and they were comparing their whole training regimes. So the thinking was, how can we make things better for them? So they got 40 grand a year to help them maybe improve their whole uh, uh, physical preparation, had they access to the right gyms, had they the right equipment, did they have the right um, GPS system to monitor what was going on, match analysis, did they have, could they bring in some additional coaches that would help with expenses in that area, and this was all done on the basis that if they could prove that these things were happening, they got their money, so they weren't just getting a, a check in the post, as it were. Now, I mean, that's what needs to maybe happen again and happen further. Last night, Don Logue mentioned uh, Kildare, maybe uh, Meath, maybe Kerry as well. And, and that's a fair point because they felt maybe left out of that. But for as long as we've been talking hurling, uh, not just on this programme, but on every other programme, the bottom of Tier 1 and the top of Tier 2, if you want to put it that way, that has always been an issue, Shane. It hasn't just arisen this weekend with those two results. It's always been the case. But I'm telling you, if you talk to a Leash or Westmead player this morning, they will still say, I want to play in Tier 1 and uh, rather than play in Tier 2. And Michael's own county, Offaly, what they wouldn't give to be up back up in Tier 1 and, and hurling would be the better for it if they could get up there as well. But such is the, such is the way it is. I mean, the, and that's why those tiers of Joe McDonough, Christy Ring, Lowry Marr and Nicky Rackard uh, were developed in order to give counties a level at which they can play competitive, competitively. And by and large, that has worked out very well. But the bottom of Tier 1, Lee McCarthy, has always been a challenge. And unless you turn around and say to those counties, sorry, you're not good enough, there's only nine counties that are really competitive here. And I think that will be unfair because I think the, those, those players will want to play in Tier 1 and they're there by virtue of the system and by right. And that's why I feel that they need to, they need to get plenty of support. And they do get support, but maybe we just need to reflect more on how we can support some of those counties. Mm. And let's not forget that both Leash pushed Dublin all the way in the first mm. weekend and Westmead were 
pretty much you know, they were within three points of maybe 25 minutes to go against Kilkenny the first day out. So maybe it's just, I mean, in terms of depth, when Leash get all of those injuries, like Podge Delaney, captain wasn't there, Ross King, Ben Conroy, Mark Kavna, Piki Maher, Willie Dunphy, it's too much to ask. No, you're right. I mean, they're, they're a huge loss. And, I mean, the this has been not been disrespectful to anybody who come in and replace them. I mean, Leash were just simply poor and Kilkenny were, were, were gung-ho. They were going for the highest possible score because from a Kilkenny perspective, I mean, the county knows that it is heading to Galway and the, the serious, the really serious competitive hurling is going to start this weekend. And, and that's not being disrespectful. It's just the way the, the, the dice fell from Kilkenny's point of view that they would meet Leash and Westmeath in the first two matches. Now, whether that is going to work out to their advantage or disadvantage, time will tell. But it's going to be a hell of a different story from next week on. Dublin are going to be a much different proposition in Parnell Park. You're not going to see what we saw in the National League there. And it could come down to a Saturday evening in Nolan Park between Wexford and Kilkenny. That could yet be, uh, from a Leinster perspective, it could be the game in the Leinster Championship that there could be a lot riding on. Yeah, Michael? Yeah, no, I tell you what, I, I, my worries would be that, you know, if Westmead are taking these types of beatings and Leash are taking te- these types of beatings at the moment, would be that when we get to the preliminary all our quarterfinals, two games that we should be looking forward to, that, the, you know, they're potentially two big drubbins coming down the line for teams that are further down the pecking order as well. I'm not sure if that has to be reassessed about uh, about the Joe McDonough team, Cup teams coming in at that stage, uh, particularly if we have six in Leinster. We're obviously not always going to have that. But it it's an unbelievable incentive for them, obviously. But I'm not sure, like, at that stage of the championship, we should be having really, really competitive games. We're going, you know, there's a lot, say, Tipperary and someone else in Munster will be out. Uh Wexford, Dublin, maybe, and two more teams would be out of Leinster. And then there's two teams coming in the preliminary quarterfinals, potentially getting two big shellackins. I'm just not sure. It's a very, very difficult balance to find because um, the, the, the quality changes year on year. One year, you're thinking, yeah, it would be great to have McDonough Cup teams getting to another preliminary or All Ireland quarter final. This year, I don't think it will work at all. I just don't think there'll be competitive games. But and Nikki has said it has always been a problem and will always be a problem. The number of teams that are playing competitive hurling. Um, we probably, with regards to investment, we probably need to wor- really look at how can we make counties sustainable, like the GA have helped to make Dublin hurling sustainable. How can we make more counties sustainable that we, not that we don't need to look after them anymore, but they will look after their boat now. They will, Dublin have stayed at that level, stayed at a really competitive level. And it's just a matter of trying to get other teams to that level as well. Yeah, we're going to be bringing on John O'Mahony to talk about the Connacht final shortly. Nicky, just a, a point then on Henry Shefflin. He got his first win as an inter-county manager over Westmead. So for, for him to be able to do it away from the spotlight after you know all the attention on the, on, the, on the Wexford game when they drew the week before, it's a nice positive for him ahead of the Kilkenny game. Oh, of course it is, yeah. And again, look, they were going to uh, pile up the scores and obviously the players themselves wanted to give some answers after the previous week in Wexford where they feel they left the game uh, behind them. So yes, it will. Uh, it will. Henry will be delighted with that. Look, he's going to be without Connor, Connor Whelan, Connor Whelan, I should say, uh, and that's going to be a big one. And just see a, a flash up on the screen there, the Kenny Galway, the the game of the weekend. Look, it is going to be for uh, for many reasons because uh, apart from the the great rivalry there, the games and everything, rather uh, they, you know, you have the two guys patrolling the sideline that have been two of the biggest names in Kilkenny in a long, long time. Now, as a, as a total aside on the matter, on the following day at four o'clock in Tullamore. Kilkenny play off in the Leinster under 20 semi final. So it's going to be a big weekend of Kilkenny uh, Galway hurling. And uh, I think this is going to be a real, real dinner of a game. Brian Cody will not want to be beaten over in Salt Hill by Henry Shefflin. Mark my words. I can tell you one thing. If ever he was fired up for a match, take it. This is the one he's going to be fired up on. You can't have the pupil beating the master in this one. That's the way he will be looking at it. Wouldn't it be some crack if, if, if uh, like Liam Sheedy did back in the day, if Shefflin somehow squared up to Cody or gave him a little bump on the sideline? I don't see it happening, but the, that whole aspect of it is going to be fascinating this weekend. Asher, sure, look, that's going to take a lot of the headlines in a way, Michael. And uh, look, both of them realised that. I mean, it's a, it's a big call for, for Henry to go to Galway. He did get the opportunity to uh, work with Cody and uh, he felt that's not the way he wanted to go. And uh, he got the call from Galway. And I suppose having won two county championships with uh, with Shamrock's Valley Hale and two All Ireland club titles. Look, uh, it was it was inevitable he was going to try his hand on the inter county scene. Maybe Galway 
maybe Galway was far enough from Kilkenny in many respects, and maybe he saw it as uh, as uh, the, the prospect that has failed to be blossoming for so long that he still thought there was something big there. And we all do. We all think that Galway have some of the greatest hurlers that are there. They just don't seem to light that fire uh, that often, and uh, maybe he feels it's going to uh, it's going to happen. It could happen. It'll take him time, uh, and who knows? But telling you, Sunday's episode is going to be one uh, that for a lot of people are going to admire. Mm, you've teed it up brilliantly there, Nicky. Delighted you joined us this morning. Thank you very much, and hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Thank you, guys. Take care. Cheers, Nicky. Great to have Nicky there. Uh, delighted to say we're now joined by John O'Mahony. John, how are you this morning? How are you doing, guys? Uh, good, yeah, good. Yeah, not too bad at all. Uh, the the Connacht football final, we'll jump into it straight away. Galway won 14, Mayo 16 points at McHale Park yesterday. I mean, what a thrilling finale. Galway looked to have it all um, kind of sewn up. And then this thrilling comeback from Mayo, and they just couldn't quite get there. Obviously, had that wide at the end as Aidan Orm had a shot. It just kind of dragged wide. Can you sum up what you what you made of the game? Well, first of all, I think you jumped a couple of hurdles there. It was kind of quarterfinal, but uh, quarterfinal. Sorry, yeah, that's that's okay. Uh, no, I mean it was. Uh, look at it. The setting was wonderful in the sense of it was a day borrowed from the from the summer, really. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, it was a defining game for Galway, with all the questions that had been asked about them in the last you know couple of years. Uh, they needed to win this one. And they produced the goods in a, a real team display, I would say. And, uh, you know, ever since um, Kevin Walsh era, who, who brought them close, uh, you had a, at the end of his era, there was a question that they were too defensive. In the last year, it was that the, the opposite were, you know, even in the league final, 22 points against, uh, against uh, Roscommon, but, you know, allowing Jerwood Murtha to to range the field and score that goal. So I think Galway got the balance right yesterday. Uh, they looked, it was a real team display. And I suppose what, you know, sum it up in one sentence, you know, you could you could say, look, this is, this is Galway on the way up and possibly Mayo on the way down. Although Mayo will, will benefit hugely from their injured stars if they get them back, but they'll need them back for the, for the for the qualifier route now, which is going to be a shorter road, but a more difficult road than Mayo travelled in the past when they maybe got an easy game first. That won't be happening, I would imagine, the fact that it's just Division 1 and Division 2 teams. So, look at it's all to play for, but the potential now that's in Galway, and I've always said this about Galway over the years, they can come literally from nowhere, uh, and, and this will be a huge injection of... A positivity in the goal of dressing room as a result of what happened yesterday, the way they won it, uh, and and also the way that they, you know, the 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 bench, the use of the bench, they got more use from their bench players than 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 Mayo did, and I think they'll be they'll be waking up to all kinds of possibilities. I remember back in 1998, we left Castle Bar. And we didn't say it openly at the time, but we felt that there was a great road ahead of us that year. And I, I think Galway, you know, can become contenders. They obviously have Leitrim now in the in the in the uh, semi final. That that will be that the they'll give Leitrim respect, but you know you can only see one result there. And like Roscommon has beaten them twice already this year, so I'd imagine there won't be much need for motivation even from Porrick Joyce at this stage for for that game down the line. Now, I'm not discounting Sligo as common enough to play Sligo next weekend, but in all in all it would be a major shock of the of the decade if it wasn't just common and Galway in a Connacht final. Do you um how big known Porrick Joyce, how big was it is it for him personally to get that victory over Mayo? We saw the photographs afterwards. He looked absolutely ecstatic with it. Yes, I mean, look at it, 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 it. You know, the the reality was, if you look back at the history of the, you know, back to last year's league, the way that Galway got demoted from Division One to Division Two up against Mana in a game that they had closed out or should, you know, could have closed out, uh, and then the collapse in the second half of the Connacht final, and uh, like the fact of the lead, the two games against Roscommon then where. Where you know the first day Galway put out a weakened team, they are already qualified for Division One, 
and was calm and got it over on them. But I, I would have thought that they would have really got, went gung ho for for the the Division Two final. But the, the way that they lost that was, you know, it was adding to a narrative of, you know, they're not they're they're good going forward, but their defense is is not uh, it's not happening for them. And like. To win yesterday, what they needed to do coming in was shore up the defence, and they did that brilliantly. Uh, and also get an early start, and and even James Horden referred to it in his interview after the match yesterday. You know that they win six points down, and and all of Galway's scores in that early period were from play. Shane Walsh got his first first score, and Comer, Damien Comer's laying on of the of the goal was absolutely brilliant. So, you know, in the past, Damien just put the head down most times and went to cut through, but he, he spotted uh, Johnny Heaney, who, who lost Aidan O'Shea, and, and really, you know, it was it was an ultimate uh, team display. Uh, while there's a, an awful lot of potential in it, and they will have to improve. I mean, the way that Mayo came back at them at the end was encouraging for Mayo heading the qualifier route, but at the end of the day, they probably shouldn't. You know, Gaul will be saying, "Well, if we get that in that situation again, now we we, we shouldn't allow teams to come back at us like that." But uh, they'll have learned a huge amount from yesterday. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, no, I just think it's it's it, it does look like a bit of a, a kind of a rain-defining win for Jace, and you could see the emo- you could see the emotion after and what it meant to them. Um, it's funny. I think um, I think Parik Jace probably came in. And even with those early league performances, you have an idea in your head how you want to play and you want to play this swashbuckling style and put up huge scores. The, the realism about inter-county management, and I'm sure John will be able to talk on this, is you might you have to be very realistic about what way you can actually play. Um, you can put up big scores and have everybody going forward. But the big lesson that they learned, I think, from that league final was showing up things at the back. And it wasn't just having bodies there it was having active bodies it was having guys that were able to get their hand in it was putting that extra bit of pressure on shots like Mayo didn't really get too many you know really uh, obvious goal chances oh McLaughlin broke the line once put a bit of a scorching shot over the bar but it was never really a goal chance the pressure that was being put on them by Galway bodies was huge and you just you, you think now potentially from a Galway point of view the release valve could come now the, the pressure not that the pressure is always on but that the pressure might be off a small but this is the first time they've beaten Mayo in in four attempts and you know, all Kevin Walsh had a great record against against Mayo then all of a sudden in recent years the the it kind of turned again turned back the other way but you, you'd hope now from a, from a Galway point of view that they were they were looking. I'm sure at the outside in last year, seeing Tyrone, um, uh, coming from you know maybe just out of the pack, maybe to win in All Ireland. The Galways, the Monaghans, the Donegals. I'm sure would have got a lot of confidence from that, and I'm sure Galway will have huge confidence after after yesterday's win and surviving that scare as well. And as John says. It, at least it, it, it didn't take a draw or a defeat to realise we need to do an X, Y and Z to shore up at the end of the game. Um, and I'm sure they will be a lot better equipped to make sure that they don't let teams back into it if uh, that, that kind of if they are holding a lead with four or five minutes to go that they'll deal with it a lot better maybe than they did yesterday. But, yeah, I, I, and I think in every measurement you take yesterday uh, Galway had the the edge like for instance Killian O'Connor was back on the freeze but he, he missed a couple of crucial ones whereas Shane Walsh in the middle of that second half with those 45 was immaculate uh, and like there was a, a cross win there uh, that but, but he, he, he was unerring in, in the way that he did it. The other thing that in the first half you mentioned the old McLaughlin point that was I think after 20 minutes that was the first score that Mayo had got from play. Uh, all of their all of their points ahead of that were from freeze, uh, and you know you had you had Galway who who were scoring more from play. So you know the the scoring spread as well in Galway was interesting. Like there they were coming, you know the Paul Conrays, the Johnny Heaney's, uh, the the Damian Comer with the points, and and the. Killian McDade point in the second half for them when they were coming under the cash a little bit 
uh, when he when he replaced Anton Ali, he, he that was a brilliant brilliant point, uh, significant than more just the point. It was the way that they, you know it was a signal that Galway on this occasion weren't going to bow the knee. And uh, look at while, while this will give Galway huge confidence, I think what you mentioned about the re- the, the sense of relief, I'd say, within Porrick Joyce's uh, mind, really, was absolutely evident afterwards. It, wa- it was relief. In other words, now it, they can really start dreaming, and but obviously being cautious. Uh, and, and I think they have an ideal an ideal setup. As I said, they have Leitrim at home, and and they they have Roscommon with no you know no need for incentives they know what they have to do there although it's common will be difficult but you know when you look at the organization of the Galway defense yesterday uh, compared to the league final they had bodies around Jermud Murta when he scored that goal but they weren't engaging yesterday they were getting tackles in they were okay they were in the first half they fouled a little bit but the, the, there'll be huge huge uh, benefit from that and obviously the I'd say the organization that Keen O'Neill put on things there as well was a, you know an addition in other words like Porrick really it was all about winning you know and, and improving and correcting the mistakes that they were making in the last 18 months really and and like there is there is more you know there is a lot of potential now I, I think in that Galway team if they if they deliver on what they what they started yesterday. Just on that, Shane, as well, I think it's funny, uh, even Keane O'Neill's involvement, like just going back to Cork beating Kerry in that famous Munster semi-final, it was kind of, it was all for nothing almost when they were beaten in the Munster final by Tipperary. Um, Galway uh, and Keane O'Neill's involvement in that and knowing that, fair enough, we beat we beat Mayo, but it's, it's not all for nothing if they don't beat Roscommon, but it'll be keeping the feet on the ground. I think it's nice even to have another game potentially leading into that Connacht final, but They'll be unbelievably happy with yesterday, but they won't lose the run of themselves as well. And I think his involvement in that is is key. Well, yeah, because there's enough, there's enough things to improve on, like the 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 bit, the fouling maybe in the first half, and the allowing Mayo back into it. So it's an ideal situation. It would be, you know, it would be, it, that is a better situation to win it that way than maybe to win it coasting and 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 and. and you know, not taking things a little um, too too easy in the in the later games. They know they have still a lot of work to do, but they have a tremendous foundation laid in 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 Castlebar yesterday. And like even the physical stakes, which the the the, the um, talking to some people in Galway in the last few weeks, like the big fear they had is that they wouldn't. Uh, it's a younger Galway team that they wouldn't match the physical stakes. But at key moments yesterday, they did match it. I mean, um, Sean Kelly's bringing him back to full back was a key move for Galway in the shoring up of this defence. He's he's an absolutely tremendous player. Uh, you know, the way that he can adapt to, to filling in that role. And the, uh, there was one ball won yesterday in that crucial last few minutes uh, that that if it went, if it wasn't won, uh, it 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 could have ended up in a goal for Mayo uh, to to snatch it at the end, and it wasn't. So there was like the mental strength of Galway yesterday was obvious, and we hadn't seen that uh, for some time. Now, referring back to to last year's Connacht final where Galway collapsed in the second half, and it's significant now that the key players. Like Sean Kelly went off after 26 minutes in last year's Connacht final with a, with a hamstring injury. Shane Walsh was taken out, would coming up to half time, uh, and uh, came out in the second half, but was only a shadow, a shadow of himself. And you know, Damien Colmer faded out of the game yet yeah, last year as well in in the second half. And and you know, we see now the contrast of what happens. When, when when they didn't fade and when they like Paul Conroy, Comer, like Comer really ranged the field yesterday and played the ultimate team game, you know, and, and showed the vision 
that maybe he hadn't shown. Like Homer is a he's a, a a juggernaut when he gets the ball, but yesterday he showed peripheral vision, which he hadn't done in his career. It much up to now, but he did it. That's why Galway are facing Leitrim uh, on on Sunday week in in, in Pierce Stadium. So he, he you know he got the man of the match and he he fully deserved it. Although Johnny Heaney was really up there as well, and and as I said, the bench. The bench press from from Galway with Paul Kelly coming in and Killian McDade, they got more out of it. Like if you think of Aidan Orm there in the last, you know, he rushed his shot from from a left footed kicker. It's difficult. Look at it, it's it's easy to say it now, but it, it you know Galway got those crucial scores, whereas Mayo just faded out. But like it's not all doom and gloom for Mayo. And they will take huge benefit. Like Paddy Durkin was sorely missed in that defence for Galway and the, the going forward threat. Lee Keegan did it his a fair bit, but he was he you know they had their hands full with the the, the way that the Galway forwards ran at them. So you know it's it's this was a traditional nip and tuck match, uh, and uh, Galway will be absolutely thrilled with with the way that they they, they got through it. Uh, and, and still having a lot to do, but would now have a have a really they'll really look forward to coming into training tomorrow evening or whenever they. I'm sure they'll be in the in the pools and the recovery stages today. But it's a it's a it was a a day borrowed, as I said, from from summer. But it'll be it'll feel like summertime in Galway for the next few days. Absolutely. Yeah, John. When you when you reflect on where Mayo are at and the injuries they've had, you know, Oshin Mullen had to go off. Paddy Durkin not there. Rob Henley, Jordan Flynn, Tommy Conroy's out for the season. Like James Horn is probably he's in I think season seven now, and he's he's obviously still pressing to get that All Ireland all the time. But what's the mood like when you consider like he is down some key players, but you know at some stage patience will probably wear thin too because pe- people want that breakthrough to happen and they're wondering will it. Well, look at Tommy Conroy is a huge loss to me all this year, and I said that out from the outset. Like, and I suppose people were people were saying, "Well, Killian O'Connor will be back, and he'll take up that mantle." But they're different type of players. Obviously, Killian O'Connor is huge leadership and and uh, experience and all of that, but he wouldn't have the pace of Tommy Conroy, and and like I, I saw. Tommy Conroy in the first league game against Donegal. I don't think he actually scored on the day, but by taking on men one to one, he's created a whole lot of chances for others, and that's what Mayo were missing yesterday. They couldn't break down that Galway well organised defence. They didn't have people to get past men on a one to one to set up chances. And look at Ryan O'Donnell, who did did fantastic in some ways. He scored from play, and and and, and he was always, you know, he. he he has become a real threat, real threat for Mayo, uh, you know, in the last in the last year, uh, and 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 in all essence, the reason Mayo were in the league final was because of Ryan O'Donoghue, both from freeze and, and and from play, and he continued in that vein yesterday. But he, I'm sure, you know, deep down, he was missing Tommy Conroy as well because he'd he'd have he'd have set up a whole lot of chances there. That he's a huge loss. Paddy Durkin is as well. Now he will be back, but obviously Conroy Conroy is out. So it it's a look at it's a difficult road ahead for Mayo. But you know who who we we have learned over the years not to write them off. They have huge resilience, and even yesterday, you know, they never dropped the knee either. But like look at this isn't this isn't the Mayo team of four or five years ago with. With the Colin Boyles and the Keith Higginses and so on at their at their peak, uh, and there is you know a re you know in 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 the in the medium term there's a rebuilding job to be done here, but they won't be thinking of that. They'll be thinking of getting back on the horse in this year's championship. But as I say, that first game, whoever it is against, it will be key. I mean, if if it happened to be our man Mayo, like. Amara, uh, where I I only saw about fifteen minutes of that game yesterday, but they were, you know, they they'll be f- really feeling glum this morning as well because, you know, the the pressing that they did after half time, and got nothing from it, and then Donegal coming down the down and, and getting a goal and a point, uh, Donegal like, and I I know I'm diverting here a little, but but Donegal. 
had shown a soft centre, the old Donegal in recent recent times, but they showed a hard edge yesterday. Uh, that bodes well, bodes well for them. But getting back to Mayo, if, if Mayo meet Armagh, like the, you'll have two teams uh, absolutely uh, needing to get back on the horse, and it'll be that that'll be some game if it emerged there. But we'll have to wait and see how that goes. This is just a general question, John, but it came to my mind when we're thinking about Parik Joyce is on one sideline yesterday, Kira McDonald was on the other, and we, me and Shane were just chatting before you came on. Like, would which one of them would be the best player you coached throughout your career, or would it be somebody else that would come into the equation? No, oh, no, you know, Kira McDonald was probably one of the best individual players uh, that that played for Mayo. You know, over any any years, but I'd say Pori Joyce was a tremendous individual player, but he was a tremendous team player as well. And you know, and and I suppose you had so many good forwards in that in that team that I had for seven years back from ninety eight, uh, and uh, they they were so so good. But they were tremendous individual players, but they were great team players. Kieran McDonald maybe had to carry the can a little bit uh, on his own on a n- numerous occasions, uh, but but I would say that I would say that Joyce was the ultimate team player, where McDonald did so many super things individually, but not as much as a as, as a team player as Joyce. I suppose that's the that's maybe a, a harsh judgment, but that's the way I would see it from having worked with the two of them. Did you um, did you expect? Park Joyce to become a manager, even the other side, then Kieran McDonald to be involved in coaching James Horn to become a manager when you when you had them as players. Yeah, I mean, look at I, I take great pride in all the former players that I coach being managers, and like in this year's um, uh, Connacht Championship, you have three of James Horn. I had him as, as an under three one player back in as far back as nineteen ninety one, uh, uh, and you know you always expected him. When he when he came through and you know won his all stars and so on, you know, he was a deep thinker about the uh, about the game, uh, and and Imorn is is playing his trade now in Leitrim as well. But Porik Joyce, I suppose the challenge for management with Porik was he was such a good player himself, does it, and there's a huge difference in being you know he didn't need any if you like psychological coaching or anything else. He had super. Confidence. He was a part of that Jarlitz team, along with the Divleys and Meehan's and so on, and uh, uh, and Michael Donlan that that won the All Ireland for Jarlitz. And he was the challenge for him coming into management was, I suppose, to to connect with the players that maybe it's a young team that wouldn't be as confident and as strong with him. And obviously. You know that that is what has happened now, or it looks it looked to be happening yesterday, where he you know he's now beginning, and that yesterday was the first the first real evidence of that that he's bringing the best out of you know players that uh, needed that lift of confidence uh, and, and and hand up from a manager, and you know it's, it's, it's great to see that. And so yesterday was a huge development in Porrick Joyce's managerial managerial career because you know sometimes you 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 get great players who don't get become great managers because maybe they don't understand how a lesser player you, you need to use a carrot and stick approach which sometimes it's stick but it's a carrot with fellas young players coming in and and Porek seemed to have done that yesterday with 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 players who now can grow and hugely develop going forward michael yeah, no, I just I do think it's fascinating from that managerial point of view. Uh, if you look to you know the Premier League, a lot of the best managers are not journeymen, but they're guys that really had to graft and really had to um, max out every little bit of not necessarily talent. Maybe it was more perspiration than talent. Whereas the great players, not that it came easier to them, but that. They were just maybe on a higher level than a lot of lot of their teammates, and maybe it's hard to resonate with that guy who, 
you know, maybe it's just a man marker who's just a spoiler or something like yeah. that. They've, yeah, they've yeah. never had to be that player. They're always the one maybe that yeah. teams are trying to spoil. But uh, I, I, it's it's fascinating when John says there the amount of guys and you, you look at you know Kevin Walsh and a few more guys. You've had a fair amount of people under your tutelage, John, that have gone on to be uh, inter county managers. Well, yeah, they have, yeah, and I mean, I really like. I like take great as I said. Peter Ford succeeded me in Galway, won an All Ireland under twenty one, and uh, won a you know kind of final with them. You have Kevin McStay, like, oh, like as I said, Andy Moore and James Horn, uh, and Porrick Joyce this year, three of them, and then other years you had Kevin Walsh, Kevin McStay, uh, P- as I said, Peter Ford, uh, and, and John Mahan, of course, all of them, and and. Uh, Look at I love to see them, you know. I suppose says spreading the gospel and and developing into into that and and uh, you know at, at the stage I'm at now it's it's I, I take great pride in that and and uh, like Andy Andy Morden going down to Leitrim uh, as well. Uh, I hope you know and he 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 obviously has a, a big future in in in, in management uh, and Michael Solon along with them there as well. So it, it's uh, not only are they from Mayo, but they're from my own club. So I, I take a particular pride in seeing them progressing. They were on an All Ireland Colleges team that won with St Nathan's College under me in 2000, and and uh, I remember in those days they were they were so willing to so willing to learn. And I remember one day we we played uh, we played a. a Big match against St Gerald's Castle Bar, and there was a clash of colours. And I happened to have the, I happened to have the Galway set of Galway jerseys in the in the boot of the car that they used. And when I was handing out the number eleven, oh, that's 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 Jeff Allen's jersey, and number fourteen was Porrick Joyce's. So, like, you know, these fellas fee, fed off that off that. So yeah, it's great to see the youngsters. The young, as I call them the youngsters from where I'm at. Uh, coming into management and like it, it's it's a cha- management is more challenging now than it was in 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 my day. Uh, in some in some respects, the the core values haven't haven't changed, but the the amount of science and uh, like uh, we we won uh, in All Ireland uh, from two forty foot containers in Loch George, where when I, I had all the boots, all the the footballs and the. The, the cones in, in my own boost like now you have kit vans and all the rest of it and you, you a manager now has to be a manager of a backroom team uh, he's a kind of a chief executive to 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 keep everyone keep everyone going where whereas you know it was it was a, a lesser one day and sometimes you know it it was in some ways more enjoyable and more innocent times, but it has it has gone into a, a new era now. And you have then, of course, the big challenge that we hadn't back then was social media, where you know to keep a camp happy, uh, the panels are bigger now, and to keep everyone happy is uh, is more challenging than it was it was then. But uh, you know, I have I have great memories of it, and I have great admiration for the the new styles that are there that are there now and and the expansive backroom teams you know where you see them lined out on all Ireland final day there there there's a bigger panel in back some backroom teams than there has been on 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 players in the past on players in the past i remember winning a kind of final with Leitrim with 26 players in the panel like i think dublin had more backroom members than that when they were winning all Ireland you know can I just ask you lastly, John, you talked about about innocent times. Um the the documentary that was made in 1998, a year till Sunday, what were the was there agreements around that or like would it was it always going to be published even if it didn't go as planned, shall we say? Um was it did you think it was a risk even signing up for that? Or can you just talk me through the background of that? Ah, uh, well, it, what that was about was trust really between myself and Pat Comer, like. Uh, you know, and he obviously did all the, 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 they had, he had tried to do it with Mayo the previous year, uh, in the 90, for the 97 All Ireland. I think he was calling it a month till Sunday. In other words, was, he was trying to, to, to get it from All Ireland semi final to final with John Mahan. But obviously, like in my case, the deci- it was easier decision to make because I trust Pat Colmer. Uh, and uh, he was within the dressing room, and we weren't conscious of it as it went ahead. 
whether it would have been, it would, probably wouldn't have been as big a hit if, if it may have been published, but it wouldn't have been as big a hit if we hadn't won the All Ireland. But you know, it was great as the year when you know when you look back on it now, uh, it was scary at times because Pat Comer was sub goalie. So if anything happened to Martin McNamara, for instance, in the All Ireland final. Uh, Pat Comer would have to drop us. He had his camera in the dugout in 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 ninety eight final. Uh, you know to, he, the creativity that he you know that he does. But like he'd have to drop the camera and head into goals. And like if if anything happened uh, negatively, my head would have been cut off. But I I I uh, I really you know it it, it was a, I think it was a. A, a documentary for the ages, really. They, it was a very unusual circumstances, and and uh, I'm delighted that it that it was done, uh, because I always, as you know, a young supporter, many years, you always wondered what it was like inside the the camp, and and the lads. The great thing is, the year progressed. You know, Pat would have the he'd have the camera in the duffel bag. You know, when we'd be at team meetings and and so on. I often wondered at the time it couldn't maybe have been shown, but we had we had uh, you know those moments that you were you know you wanted to win other All Irelands after it, so you, you weren't giving all the secrets away in it. But we you know Keith Wood had a big involvement with us in the lead up to the All Ireland. Uh, and I, 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 I think Sapori Joyce did something similar this week. But I, 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 I uh, it, it was a, you know, it could have been any county really, but it was, it, it was Galway, and 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 it was look what he did a mighty job on it. So I, I don't regret it, but I often think of what might have happened if things went wrong uh, as a result of his of his distraction, uh, if you like. Uh, but he, he, he was a supreme professional and, and uh, he has done many, many good ones since. But I think that was, that 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 launched him on the, 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 the Oscar route, let's say. <laughs> Brilliant stuff, John. Really appreciate you joining us today and really oh, enjoyed your no insights. Problem. No problem. Looking forward to the rest of the year. Okay, Thanks, that's... John. Come on, All the best, John. Gentlemen, thank you. That, yes, Shane, that's unbelievable. I wasn't aware. I wasn't aware that that Pat Comer was sub goalie. Like that's like imagine to say he had the the camcorder out in the dugout. Basically, that's absolutely mad. The cheek of it, like it's, <laughs> it's it's so gutsy. I mean, from from Pat's point of view, like exactly what John said there. Imagine if he was called to go in and he's yeah. like, you know, that John says, "Hey, Pat." Up you come here, and mm. what's he do? Does he pass the camera over to one of the other substitutes? I was more asking John from the point of view of like how alien would that concept be now? Let alone a player doing the documentary, anybody doing the documentary. It's absolutely fascinating. Oh, it sure is. Um, we'll just run through some of the other results of football and then we'll circle back to a little bit of the hurling that we hadn't touched already. Um, first of all, G10 says great interview there. Uh, Porter Porter, how far can Galway go in championship football? Uh, we couldn't really keep John much longer there he'd been brilliant with his time so we didn't have a chance to go quite into that but I'm very interested to see and you know what Donegal beat in Armagh 116 to 12 points in the Ulster quarter final obviously Cavan went in to Corrigan Park and put away Antrim pretty easily 120 to 10 points but with Donegal they didn't bother going down the um the route of appeal and suspensions to Neil McGee and to um to Hugh uh, or McFadden Ferry they didn't bother with that Antrim went the other route. They did get lads off for suspension and they, they had them available to play at the likes of, you know, Reen O'Neill, who wouldn't want to play with the likes of him and so on. And I just wondered, did all of that stuff provide a big sideshow for Armagh and distract them? Or is this just true to form with Armagh in the Ulster Championship in recent years? They're just not quite getting it done. There's a bit of watch and I'd say there's the, there's the sideshow of the hours that are needed, the energy that's needed, the time that's needed. Um, some you know if they were missing these players other guys were going to have to step in nobody probably maybe knew their role until maybe mid to late of, of, of last week which is a very very tricky one we saw it with Dermot Connolly getting on and uh, getting off before and he had you know minimal impact in an All-Ireland final there's a lot of energy used up I'd say in the build-up to it I'd say there was a bit of a siege mentality from a, a Donegal point of view as well is that maybe they they uh, they took their medicine and just ploughed on without the two boys and I, I heard Declan Bonner say yesterday that they basically told the boys just be back available ready to go for a semi-final um, and you know Bonner called the, the process um, the appeals process a bit of a farce and it is a bit of a farce because 
we talked earlier in the year and I remember, remember it vividly because we had Stephen Porcher on and we said, is, you know, is this going to be a moment for the GA where they, they stamp out, you know, you know, we'll say some, some instances in games, they say red cards are red cards. If you're sent off in a game, you're suspended, you take your medicine or whatever. And it kind of looks like when push comes to show for a championship, that's not the case. And uh, it was, it, you know, the whole thing is it was a bit of a farce, really, that they were that they were all able to get off. Well, fair play to Donegal. There's been a good few question marks about them. Um, potentially a bit of a probably soft underbelly. Maybe we would have said in recent years they haven't got the job done uh, at various stages. But you probably flip that back on our man. Like their their Ulster record now after yesterday's, you know, so poor, so poor. And when when it seems to be when something is expected of them. It just don't seem to deliver. It's you know I remember a couple of years ago they played Donegal in a big was in a big qualifier a couple of years ago and uh, Donegal put a huge score put a huge score or it might have been the Ulster Championship actually a couple it was, of years it was just ago. in yeah. the winter one they got yeah pasted. that's right yeah 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 they absolutely pasted them and as, as Sean Cavanagh said last night on the Sunday game like seven points is a hammer in Ulster football. You know, a point or two is, you know, that's the general the general margin of victory when most of these top teams come up against each other and uh, just really disappointed. Like, I think Armagh will probably go on a run again. They will. They'll go on a run through the qualifiers, but their inability to get the job done when there's that expectation or pressure on them has come home to roost again. And also the early season form. We You, you just don't know what different teams are doing at different times, but they were flying at the early stages of the league. We... Uh, we kind of suspected maybe that they were a bit ahead of other teams physically and it looks like everyone else is caught up and passed them out at this stage. And everyone was so excited about what Armagh might do this year. Uh, maybe in the same way that people are now getting excited about potentially what can Galway do. I don't really see Galway jumping right into the All-Ireland conversation just yet. I think it's very early doors, but beating you know what is a big gun and Mayo is probably adding to that. But like this wasn't Mayo anywhere near 100% and they're down attackers and the whole lot. Liam Lennon says, seconds the fact that it was a great interview with there, there with John O'Mahony. And by the way, keep an eye out for Thursday's show on patreon.com forward slash our game because there's always great stuff there with Kieran Carey, with uh, Richie Power and with the other guests that we always get on there too. So the only way you'll be able to see the full thing is patreon.com forward slash our game and a great way to support independent Irish media as well. Oh, and yeah, boy, yeah, yeah. So give, hey. all the, give all the support you can get. Yeah, it's true, it's true. Um, also, uh, support orgaretro.com because they're bringing out some great jerseys as we're wearing on screen and as you'll see here with the models here, 15% off using the promo code our game, they're fantastic jerseys. Just hey, wouldn't, wouldn't it be funny if me and you were used as the models sometime and we got real professional photos taken, you know, a bit of blue steel and whatever. Why have you never ca been called in to be a model? No, <laughs> definitely. Well, there was, I don't know, we I don't know if we actually said it on the show, but uh, if you look very, very closely, it probably won't you won't see it for the rest of the year. But that the Alliance ad building up to the leagues, you can see me actually. Um, and thanks to you, I had my two exposures with TV. My head is down like that in the dressing room wearing a Carlo jersey, and I think you're in it making a big catch, even though I couldn't really make you out. A big uncontested catch for the yellow <laughs> bit. Watch out for that Alliance ad, all right. Um, what was I going to say? But by the way, we were at uh, I was at Wedden's, uh, Vernie's wedding party over the weekend. He had the cheek to go abroad and get married and invite nobody, only the parents. <laughs> but he had a bit of a wedding party over the weekend, and there was wall to wall professional photographs of you and Elaine. To be fair, looking well. Congrats. Ah, sure. Listen, listen. They, it's the magic of professional photography. They can do anything. They can make any. Oh, any that's a great thing. They can make any ape look acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> so the CGI was unbelievable. Uh, the, Len the Leinster Football Championship over the weekend, Sam Mulroy scored 2-5 for Loud as they beat Carlo 5-10 to 10 points. And uh, a fair old pace for Carlo, it has to be said. I mean, conceding five goals, which also was the situation for Leash. And you could see uh, how frustrated Billy Sheehan was when he was on TV afterwards. Kevin Quinn scored a hat-trick for Wicklow. His second goal was brilliant, just weaving patience, just a bit of suddenness to get and break his way through. By the way, Kieran Burns finished for the, the first goal for Louth, where the ball came across him on the ground. Someone had just centered it along the ground as well, soccer style, as we like to say. He did a little fake shot 
just let the keeper go to ground and slot it in. That was brilliant from Kieran Byrne. So it's Kildare next for Loud. So Mickey uh, Mickey uh, Hart will be fancy on that challenge. Carlo That's a Hennessy. really interesting one, isn't it? Like mm. they, 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 like there's, there's a, they have a, they'll have a shot at, a, at an upset there. It's obviously going to be two Division Two teams playing each other next year in the league. But Loud are on a bit of a crest of a wave, you have to say. So I think they'll really fancy that one, even though Kildare, Kildare did have a really good league all, all in all. But that's, uh, that's going to be an interesting quarter final now. Yeah, I have some friends from Loud. They have some accent there, Loud. <laughs> uh, Wexford beat your Offaly. Obviously, we would have loved more time with John O'Mahony to ask him about John Mahon. But uh, Ben Brosnan got getting the job done. He's been on the go since 2008-ish. He scored 1-5, three of them are frees. Brilliant finish for the goal. Got really nice points. But they face Dublin next. Yeah, the, the, just a quick one on Ben. Um, ben has a, uh, I remember chatting him last year. He was very frustrated last year. He came on against, I don't know, did he come on against Wicklow or start against Wicklow in the preliminary quarter final and picked up a hamstring knock, ended up missing the Dublin game the week after. And I know he's had a lot of problems uh, with his hamstring in the last year or 18 months. But like with Brian Malone stepping away and with Dahi Waters stepping away, like he, Ben Brosnan's 34, he's on the go as you say, the guts of about, what is it, about 14 years, 15 seasons. And just to produce that yesterday, they needed probably one of their elder statesmen to stand up and produce something like that. And he was absolutely outstanding. Um, I got, you remember when the tip team was named on that Friday night when they played Limerick in 2018 and you kind of had the energy sucked out of you? Um, I got that same um, feeling when the Offaly team was named the other night and you realise Niall McNamee's not fit to play, Rory McNamee's not fit to play. And all of a sudden from thinking this is probably going to be a four or five point win, you're thinking we're, we're in big bother here. And that's exactly, that's exactly how it worked out. Um, we actually got ourselves into a great position. I think we were four or five up midway through the second half and Wexford just blitzed us thereafter. And then Ben Brosnan got the goal in the 53rd minute. And like it's a really good win for them because I think they were third for bottom in Division Four, sure, yeah. and uh, and awfully were awfully had you know were a point away from staying up in Division Two, and I think this is the fascinating thing around the Tolchin Cup. Um, I think like Wexford, Wexford fancied their chances going into that game yesterday. Fair enough, they're going to find it hard against Dublin, and they're going to be knocked out of the Leinster Championship. I, but I do think you know if the Tolchin Cup gets the promotion it deserves. Teams involved are really going to fancy a crack at each other. You put all those teams into onto a piece of paper and you try and pick out a winner and you're thinking, you know, obviously they can't all win it, but you're looking at nine or ten teams here and thinking they all will surely think they have a realistic chance of beating anyone else there and picking up some silverware. And in fairness to the Sunday game, we give out about... I, you know, me and you give out about various things, but in fairness, at least they get they put Wick, Wicklow and Wexford front and centre at the start of the show last night, and hopefully that's the sign of things to come um, from the national broadcaster as regards to promoting the the second year football competition. Do you think that um, if any players opt out of the the Talton Cup, that management might say, "Do you know what? I'm done with this player." Oh yeah, pot potentially. Um, because uh, you want players that you can go to war with, don't you? Yeah, you do. Yeah, there's nothing worse than uh, there's nothing worse than. Is it a soft option to take? You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Kieran Connolly and Brian O'Mara are right in that. If you know, if they're heading off at some stage during the summer, that you can't commit to the county cause. Maybe you'd prefer for a lad to do that if a lad just makes a decision a couple of weeks before, uh, what is now their championship. Um, I wouldn't be some managers would some managers would, would see the, maybe the bigger picture and be more holistic others and uh, not and I, I i don't know who's right or wrong in that situation really as well and i suppose it's a lot to do with the relationship with the all players and with those players that would potentially opt out and i suppose it's what way that message is conveyed to you as well if you find out about second hand or something like that I wouldn't be a bit surprised if, if you, you cast that player aside, but it is more than likely is something that's going to happen. I don't think that's a fair, yeah, I don't think that's a fair reason for people saying we're giving our summers to soccer or rugby or lads that head off for, for the summer. You have to, you have to just take it as, you know, the change in the split season is, you know, helping 98% of the players in the GA. So it's not enough to say, oh, it should be in the summer and you keep lads home for the summer and rugby and soccer and whatever won't take centre stage. That's not enough of a reason. By the way, I was reading the GA rulebook uh, recently. You know, 
in the spare time as you as do. you do yeah but um i came across um this was pointed out i'm not sure if everyone totally appreciates this and it might you know when people hear about new rules and new competitions they don't really always read into the fine print but uh, something i came across was and this is a quotation lifted out according to ga rule players with a j1 visa who featured on an inter-county championship team sheet submitted to the referee can automatically play in new york but they cannot travel to the other jurisdictions in the states until their county team has been eliminated from championship football, including all our all Ireland qualifier games and the Talchin Cup. It's a it's a mad one. I know I don't know why New York get dispensation, if that's what you call it. Um it's a very, very strange one. Um if I ever get into management, which I do plant at some stage, I don't care how long it takes me, but I'm gonna gorge the rule book and know like you need you... to manage your hair, never mind the team. <laughs> no, I think this is manageable enough. But uh, you need to know everything. You need to know all these loopholes. You have probably done it as well, Shane. You've chatted to managers after games where they're not 100% on the rules. Mm. And you, you Players do... definitely not. Yeah, no. And I, I just do think, I think knowledge is power um, in anything. And you need to know, uh, like, just for example, off the top of your head, like if the ball... If a flag is um, if a flag is on the sideline and the ball hits the flag, some people wouldn't potentially know the rule enough, and I actually don't know it offhand myself whether it should be a throw in or if it comes off my hurl, is it just a line ball to the other team? There are a lot of things that happen, and there are a lot of things that are contested in games. People actually don't know the rule around it. And you know what's another rule? Actually, we definitely have a couple of referees that watch this because we've been messaged by one or two of them. Give us, give us an update on that. Please comment on the show there on YouTube and we can display it on screen. Another one is, um, and I feel this might have changed, and even, you know, like the the, free, the rule around square ball. So yeah, if yeah, yeah. If it's during play, you can enter the square as soon as the ball has been struck. But if it's from a free or a line ball, you have to wait till after the ball goes in the square. And another one is, let's say you're running along the sideline with the ball and you get knocked out over, but if you hold the slitter back in, it seems that you're... You're still in play, but I yeah. feel like there was a period of time when that wasn't the case. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. Um, it's funny. I played an awful lot of football growing up, uh, Gaelic football, and like, did you know that, like, under a high ball, like, if you, I can't be facing you under the ball. Yeah, like, I, I did know that. Yeah, but a lot of people wouldn't like maybe be aware of that, and it was always something you know. It's a shout our referee during a game if it happened, but a lot of people just wouldn't be aware of that. Another one, a, a trick I used to always use in football was to hand pass the ball over a lad's head, and and you could run onto it and bring the ball on as long as the ball bounced. So if you hand passed over lad's head and caught it, it was actually a free because you're passing it to yourself. But there's a lot of different things that happens in ga- happen in games. And I do think knowledge is so important. I wondered this at the weekend. Now, there was no replay, but there was one stage when Ozzy Gleeson was caught for, I think it was for three catches. Uh, Dermot Burns was following him up the, the uncovered stand sideline. And the referee blew the whistle. Like It was a great foot race up the sideline. Burns did brilliantly. And I wondered, was he done for three catches? I think he was, because I'm fairly sure the referee had his fingers like that. But afterwards, Ozzy looked a bit frustrated. And I feel he there's a chance that as he was throwing the ball up the last time, that it might have flicked off Dermot Burns' hurley mid-air. Mid- and I wonder, would that reset the catch count? Should do, yeah. No, it should, it should reset, yeah, as far as I know, yeah. Yeah, but there's no way that the referee could have seen it. No, I mean, no. I, and honestly, I don't know if Ozzy was saying that or it was just something that occurred to me. And then I wondered afterwards, you, you know, would that rule sort of be in play? But um, it is interesting. Like, you do have to be on top of the rules. And and you know what? Declan O'Keefe is just about to take the words out of my mouth here with his comment. In NFL, manager Bill Belichick is famous for exploiting NFL rulebook rules that uh, nobody previously realized could be exploited. Yeah, I, lo- I love that. I love, like... That it, it is actually something potentially that inter county managers could exploit, as in there are rules there, there are potential advantages, um, that you could use maybe that other managers aren't doing. I, I think that's it's just it's looking for an edge, I think, really. And that's why, why knowledge, like, even if you're shouting in a rule maybe that is not commonly uh, enforced or not people don't commonly know about, you're even highlighting to the referee like this this is the rule book like people might know a lot of people might know that are on the field but you are highlighting it and maybe encouraging a decision yeah and i think sometimes before games you'd nearly go up to a referee and say look is this so in the rule book so let's say you were planning on doing something that was a little bit obscure you'd nearly tee the referee up that it's mm. going to happen like i i give you an example of something from soccer 
Uh, I can't remember who scored the goal, but there was a, a corner kick taken once by Man United. And I know Ryan Giggs was involved, but I can't remember who the other player was. But he went over to the corner flag. United had a, a corner. And he sort of just, um, someone else then came over as if they were going to take it and, and, and Giggs was going to head, head away. But the ball was just kind of ever so slightly rolled outside yeah. the quadrant. Yeah. And then they just turned around and just they were in play. And all of a sudden, I wonder, did they tee up the referee beforehand that they were going to try something like that? So, again, look, I agree with you totally. Is that going to happen sometimes in, sometime in GA soon where, I don't know, I'm just thinking Stephen Bennett off the top of my head because he's a free taker, that he's lining up to take one. But he just sort of, let's say, Ozzy Gleeson comes over and just flicks the ball on the ground. I think then... that has happened. I, I, oh, that's really ringing a bell with me that someone went over to hit a sideline ball and just barely touched the ball. I'm, our viewers might help us there, but I'm fairly sure that's happened already, I think. But you could have a disaster then, like Robert Pires and Thierry Henry with that penalty for Arsenal that time. <laughs> yeah, 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 I remember that, that yeah. Do you know, we, we, we'll jump back to the hurling now because we hadn't quite finished everything out and uh, it was great having Nicky Brennan on earlier on, I'm sure you'll all agree. But we were talking about Kilkenny. Owen Cody hit 1-5, Adrian Mullen hit 6 points, Tom Phelan, he came in and scored 1-1. Kilkenny putting up 234 plus hitting 18 wides. I mean, you're potentially looking at it, no, everyone always hits wides, but like there's enough there to be scoring 250 plus. I mean, are Kilkenny becoming the real deal here? I mean, last week, you know, well, many weeks now I'm hearing that Limerick are the only team that might put it up to, or Kilkenny are the only team that might put it up to Limerick this year. But can we really say that much after two games against teams that they're expected to be quite handily? I don't think it can, Shane, really. Um, they've, you know, the Westmead game probably wasn't impressive for about 40 to 45 minutes. Then they did what they had to do. Um, they put up a big score, as you say, at the weekend, a huge score. I think the fact that, um, I know, I know Nicky Brennan said last week that maybe having the, these two games to start mightn't necessarily be a good thing because you might be road tested. But like, Richie Power said the same on the yeah, Thursday like, show. Yeah. But look, look at the players that are coming in in form. Adrian Mullen had a poor, you know, when he came back in uh, at the end of the league. And even McBally Hale maybe wasn't up to the levels he was a couple of years ago. He's back in form now. James Marr really looks in form. Wally has carried that form in. They got game time into TJ and now he's kind of ready to go for, for the Galway game at the weekend. Um, even, you know, I know we were talking about probably Keen Kenny and David Blanchfield and uh, Mikey Butler coming into the league, but if Tom Phelan hadn't picked up a couple, uh, hamstring injury, we'd probably be talking about him as well. He obviously got two goals against Leash in the league game, got a lovely goal the other day. It looks like a real kind of poacher in around there. We, we just can't really cast too much judgment on them yet. They have their three toughest games by far coming, coming up now, but they've, you know, They've uh, they've done their score difference no harm. They've put themselves in in a really really good position in, in that respect. But uh, as as Nicky said, there it's going to be fascinating with uh, with Henry coming up against uh, his old pupil or his old master Brian Cody at the weekend. That's it's kind of the only show in town really in a way this weekend. It's it's going to be talked about for the whole week. Tell that to Cork Clare. Well, yeah, that's true too. The only the only show in town in Leinster, shall we say? But you know, when I look at the fixtures next weekend. They're all on Sunday, and Galway Kilkenny throws in at two, Leash Wexford 2.30, Westmead Dublin 3, Cork Clare 2. Could they not have been spread out a little bit more? Probably. It's something I chat to you off air. I do. I like the condensed championship, and I think it's great from the club point of view. Uh, the split season works really well in that respect. I, I, would, I just think we need maybe one week or maybe two weeks just to spread it out a small bit. Like I put it to you this way, Wexford beat awfully in the football yesterday. Massive result, huge result for Wexford. And it's like, it's so far down the pecking order. Even, you know, Wicklow beating Leash, a big result. It's very, very far down the pecking order. There's so much going on. That's not even to talk about McDonough Cup matches and Racker Cup matches. I just think we need to spread it out a tiny bit more. Not a huge amount, but a tiny bit more. Well, my point would be that I think we need to eat into the league time and just yeah. short, shorten the league. And l let's say we just make it a, a straight split here for simplicity that let's say there's six months of inter-county. Currently, maybe two and a half, three months are used up with the league and pre-season competitions. Can we get that back to a month and a half? Can we get it to two months max? And the rest gives a bit more time for championship to breathe. I actually don't mind if you slightly tilt things around and start inter-county from i don't know february we'll say until august and then have club for the rest of the year and then you know even january is used for sigerson and fitzgibbon i yeah. don't mind a little bit i don't want the club to be uh chipped away at too much because you know like you said earlier 
that's people talk about oh there's going to be no games in in august and september there are there are going to be yeah. games everywhere and you say but you won't win the hearts and minds well when i grew up the hearts and minds were being won by the local gea club the matches that everyone's going to every single week like i think a young player going to gea and like i was massively into soccer as a young lad i'm still into soccer but like uh like so i was watching them on tv that's fine but i was also going to mcdonough park in nina it, fe it feels like every single week and you're pucking around for an hour beforehand you're half keeping an eye on the match but like the the players that you were interested when you were younger were the local club lads who you know inevitably they were playing for the county as well but this thing had a massive impact on you and then you'd head down and watch the team training because they had another big match coming so i don't buy simply the whole thing that we're not winning hearts and minds i think we actually are but i do think there'd be a slight little readjustment to make yeah. championship last longer than you know just cut away at the league a little bit. i agree i know i'd agree with you on that point as well and i agree with you on the hearts and minds like I don't think there were any less people talking about Limerick and what and Limerick and uh, Waterford on Saturday night than if it was in the in the middle of July. Far from it. Um, attendances will tell you that if you, it's like you know they said in in Wayne's world, if you book them, they will come. If you fix these matches, people will come. People will watch it. People will talk about it. People will be interested. It doesn't matter when it's on. Um, people will uh, people will turn up and people will want to see it and want to talk about it. Do you know, actually, speaking of attendances, there was 27,000, I think, at Limerick Waterford, only 17,000 at Tipperary against Clare, which I thought was very disappointing. The tip public aren't really buying in and getting be behind the players, you'd have to say, because there was tickets being sent back for the first game against Waterford, and that's not going to help the players or Colin Bonner either. No, point, and that's guess. disappointing, Shane, because it like you have to just you have to just stick by your team through thick and thin you just have to um even if you're not that confident how things are go are gonna go you just you just have to you have to kind of buy in through thick and thin i would say through good and bad times yeah so uh, are you saying are you saying that there are a lot of fine weather temporary supporters that's kind of what you're implying not saying nothing like that. Not saying nothing like that. But there could there could definitely be a little bit more support. A Sully 180, I think this is talking about the quick sideline. He said Stephen Bennett to Jamie Barron in the league a few years back, then corrects uh, himself and says it was Shane Bennett with the short sideline. Yeah, he, he tapped the ball. Jamie Barron picked it up, I think, and put it over the bar. Fairly sure, yeah. yeah. And Grodo yeah. Gracon says during the 2019 league game, Watford against Galway, that was. Um, Declan O'Keefe adds Kilkenny of the physicality to match Limerick. But then again, so did Watford. I honestly think that Kilkenny would take a bit of a trim in if they play at Limerick. I, I do feel that. I, I just think um I think class wise is there. I think physically they might be able to match them for a long a long periods, but I just think class wise, I just just don't see them having anything near the same class as Limerick. Um I'd be disappointed if I don't see that matchup this year. I'm getting frustrated that you know that this matchup hasn't happened in the past couple of years. I do think um I do think it's something John Kiley craves and I think I'm sure I crave uh, it. Yeah, but no, but I'm sure, like, that's the one thing. Like, imagine they won three in a row and beat Kilkenny in the final or, or, or able to beat them along the way. I think it's it's one of the last boxes that this team has to take off is to get revenge. And that might sound a bit silly, but I, I just think, I do I do think that would be forefront of their minds. If they met Kilkenny, they'd be, they'd be absolutely tearing down the doors. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's... A bit like Clare in 1997. They'd won their All-Ireland in 1995, but in 1997, yeah. they beat Clare, they beat Kilkenny, they beat, or they beat Cork, they beat Tipperary, they beat Kilkenny, yeah. they beat all the, you know, the traditional three, as it's called. Uh, Vernie, you need to get a hot whiskey to sort out that croaky voice, Sham, but that's too much roaring at your wedding. Too much roar, and I never left the dance floor all night. I'd say um, I had a few lemsips last night, but they didn't. They didn't do much good. If I ever show up on a Monday morning with a croaky voice, you have a fair idea that I was shouting it down on some sort of a dance floor a couple of nights previous. Stephen Loftus says Connor Whelan is a massive loss ahead of uh, Sunday against Kilkenny. He's such a brilliant player. Um, he, he really is. Never doubt Kilkenny's ability to hang in there against Limerick says Richard Hogan, uh, a Kilkenny man, you can be sure. Uh, do, do you think, how impressive is it for Galway to, to put up a scoreline like that, 337? I don't think it, it matters who you're up against. Westmead are no bad side, and they've kept into it against uh, Kilkenny for a long spell. Uh, it's good for Henry, obviously, but he, he said afterwards, it's all about preparing, preparing properly and preparing respectfully to the opposition and then trying to impose our game. And I think we've seen flashes of that over the last two weeks and it would be great to see a fuller performance. Obviously, that's what we need when we're coming up against a massive challenge that is Kilkenny next weekend. Of course, it would be strange. I made peace with that a while ago when I took this job. 
I still have a job to do and it's to try and get the best out of this group of players and that's what we're striving to do. I think the players inside in the room are putting in a massive effort and any more than that, we can't ask for. So, I mean, he can't get away from it. I'd say he can't go down to the local shop down in Ballyhale without, you know, the old, <laughs> even if people aren't saying it, the, old, the eyebrows go Yeah, up. yeah. He's, um, he's very good at giving a Brian Cody-esque answer to, uh, to a question as well, in fairness. That's definitely something he learned from his previous boss. It's a, uh, Mm, yeah, no yeah. Doubt about it. Um, and also, Shefflin, um, let's see. No, we talked about that already. Wexford against Dublin. So last week, um, and I suppose even in the previews to the championship, I think you were away getting married at the time in Malta. We didn't really get your preview, our predictions for who would come out of Leinster. And I said I thought that it would be Dublin, Galway and Kilkenny. And generally, people were feeling that Wexford would get through in Dublin's place. And because Dublin weren't overly impressive against Leash, people assumed that Wexford would win at home to the Dubs. But Wexford were poor for very long stretches against Galway. And it was really the tribe letting them back into it. And a bit of brilliance from Chin towards the end and some slightly generous referee that worked out in Wexford's favour. I'm not surprised that Dublin won this game. I, I have to say, I'm not fully surprised. I thought it'd be a puck of a ball. I think that's what I said on Thursday with Richie uh, Power and Kieran Carey. But it, it is impressive nonetheless to win against your rival team Knowing that every result counts for so much in this uh, in this round, Robin. Ah, uh, this is a monster, monster win from for Dublin. Uh, I think it's actually their, their Wexford's fifth fifth championship loss to Dublin in the last ten years, which I, I wouldn't have thought. Going going back through the fixtures in my head, I couldn't have think of uh, too many losses to Dublin. But they've Dublin like this has been real 50-50 stuff. And in fairness, um. There is a bit of a partisan atmosphere down in Wexford Park. Wexford usually deliver a performance in Wexford Park as well. They usually show up when you think about even getting the result against Galway, beating Kilkenny there five years ago. Um, they're, they're usually, you know, come with a bit of a performance, but Dublin were much the better team for, you know, the vast, vast majority of this game. It was only in the last few minutes and probably when, when Keno Callaghan was off the pitch that Wexford came into it a bit more. But even you probably think Wexford didn't take advantage of the extra man enough. Maybe, you know, with hallmarks of that 2019 All-Ireland semi-final against Tipperary when John McGrath went off, they weren't able to take advantage enough. A couple of problems came home to roost again. We've talked about it so many times in this show that you have to have a free taker that's up, you know, 95% or more. I think they missed five points between Lee Chin and between Rory O'Connor. And they've, you know, they've mi- they haven't scored goals from penalties in successive games as well. And if you look at it, you know, and I and I know Mark Fanning's was a, it was a point against Galway, wasn't it? Um, it, you know, it was a brilliant save. You have to say from Sean Brennan the other day. Got down low. What was it? Low to his left. A really, yeah. really good save because it was going bottom corner. But Wexford just, you know, you have to capitalise on those chances. And even. Uh, you feel bad for Conor McDonald after you know single handedly nearly keeping a minute the week before. That was a brilliant goal chance, absolutely laid on gloriously by Rory O'Connor, wasn't it? And and also like so that that beautiful lofted ball over the top across the inside of the, the fourteen, and like what a beautiful step as well to put yeah. himself and the pirouette. And you know what? I watched it back afterwards, and uh, you know because initially I was like, could he have taken another step before finishing and really kind of loaded up? But actually, he would have been blocked down if he had to take another step. So he did the right thing. It was it was so close to being one of the sweetest goals mm. we've ever seen. Yeah, yeah. it was. It, um, it reminded me a bit of... This actually only ended up in a point. But do you remember uh, Galway in Dublin in O'Connor Park? Oh, five years ago, maybe? Canning played a ball across the square to Jason Flynn. It was outrageous. Now, Flynn blazed it over. But it was very, very similar. You know, a player with that vision to, to see that kind of ball. I think it was highlighted on the Sunday game last night. I think there were six six Dublin defenders back. But it just shows you, if a pass is that good, it can take everybody out of the game. Just to pee, it, didn't, it didn't end up in the back of the net. I think that was to, was that to level it as well? So, yeah. Wexford just it was just missed chances really hurt them. Now Darry Egan is and he, he obviously has to believe, but just the quotes he said after he said, I still feel one hundred percent that we can make the All Ireland stages. It is in our own hands now. We have three games coming up, three good battles. If we get through them, we'll have a big say. So basically, we need six points. Now it's not working out. You know, it, it, I thought I looked at that and in my head and I thought, Jesus, six points. And then you're thinking, like they do have to play a Leash, they do have to play Westmead. They will win those two games with the best win in the world. And it comes back to 
maybe hopefully having Leach in ready to go 100% for that Kilkenny game at the end of it. And if they're able to pull a result out of that, you never know. Dublin are true, right? They, Dublin are going to beat Westmead. There's, you know, Westmead will put up a good fight in that game, but I think that game yesterday showed us that the only thing is Dublin don't actually ever hammer teams. Uh, even And I know they did last year to hammer Dantrum, to be fair. But they're, they generally aren't putting away teams by massive scores. So maybe they'll have a bit of difficulty against Westmead. But I think, look, we'd all expect them to win that game. If they do, they're on six points. At this stage, Wexford, they've got uh, three games left and they are going to win a couple of those games. They're going to beat Leash and Westmead. Now, they're away from home from here on out. But the most that they can finish on from this... Uh, well, those they can two finish games, on seven. But, yeah, so that'll put them up to five. If Dublin beat Westmead, that puts them on six. So then that means Wexford have to beat either Kilkenny or Galway, which means Dublin, again, would probably get... No, no they've already played Galway now. They, they only have Sorry. to beat... Wexford just have to beat Kilkenny, I think. Sorry, really. I mixed it up a yeah. little bit. So obviously they're, they're, they should win those two games, and after that they have to beat Kilkenny. But if Kilkenny lose points, then again Dublin are probably getting through. So the way I'm looking at it, Dublin yeah. are more or less true any which way you look at it. Galway are on three points at the moment. They will... They will be beating Leash. I think we, we all would expect that to happen. After that, then, uh, Galway, even if they beat Dublin, you're still looking at probably Dublin getting through. So It's Wexford, not beyond the realms of possibility that Galway could miss out. And I know that looks... It like happened that before. Un, no, but it, it might sound unlikely at the moment. But they're going to Kilkenny, or Kilkenny are going to Pierce Stadium at the weekend. Obviously, uh, Galway are minus Conor Whelan. It's just... Uh, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that Galway, Galway could miss out and I think it's, it is really going to be fascinating and that last weekend uh, Galway are going to be I still think Galway will be playing for their lives against Dublin and Wexford in particular are the, probably the most likely the two to be or the, of, with Kilkenny I'd say Kilkenny might be true at that stage it's just I'm basing on mm how I see results coming up but that's going to be fascinating and then on the far side of it you have Leash and Westmead playing for a place in Leinster so uh, yeah it's going to it's going to be interesting very very interesting In 2019 when Galway lost out in score difference that last brilliant day when Kil Kilkenny played Wexford and I was at the game in Parnell Park I think Galway might have got on to win the All-Ireland that year if they hadn't get knocked out in score difference because Joe Canning was just back in the team there were signs of them humming at different stages. Mm. They had that brilliant win in Nolan Park without Joe Canning. I think they might have actually got on to win it, so that was so costly, which makes it exciting. A Sully 180 says, how good was Danny Suckler? Unbelievable. It, it was brilliant. From another uh, parish, like it was from downtown, like out of nowhere. And I know you had it written in the notes, Shane. It, it was frustrating to see Liam Ryan not take on the shot, an experienced player like that, who's well capable of scoring, as, as we've seen down through the years. I mean, remember that famous point against Tipperary? Mm. Didn't take on the shot, laid it on to one of the younger players on the Ushin team Pepper, in, in yeah. Ushin Pepper, and he gave away the ball then. I just think, um, it's like um, Barry Heffernan's shot yesterday. If you put the ball in around there and take on the shot, you just don't know what will happen. If you don't take on the shot, you're, ne you're never going to know. Yeah, true. Traumspieler says, Davy did some job to manage Wexford to a Leinster title. Fair is fair for Davy. Richard Hogan uh, throws in that next weekend will give a clear indication of where both Galway and Kilkenny are at, at the minute. The real, real question about Henry is uh, Hart still in it after everything that has happened next week will tell all. Um, obviously, again, we, we echo our um, sympathies towards the Shefflin family with the loss of Paul and, and of course, Kate Moran's passing as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely devastating for her friends and family, no doubt about it. Uh, Grodo go back on. How are Wexford not able to take advantage of being a man up? Semi final against Tipperary 2019, a black card for Murphy last year against Kilkenny in extra time. It is true, they are kind of struggling on the field to, to figure these things out. Stephen Loftus, how many years in a row have Wexford had issues with free take and poor indictment that they've never fixed it? League semi final should have been removed, says Joe LK20, I suppose, when we're talking about the, the setup of the championship in the weeks that we have, using them uh, the best way possible. Uh, final rounds, uh, final rounds, m final round mats on the last day in Leinster is going to be interesting. Dublin still relying on Burke a bit too much for me. Stephen Loftus, Galway are surely through. Having to beat only one of Dublin or Kilkenny at home to get through is a good position to be in. That's that's some nice uh, chickens you're counting long before they've been hatched, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Donald Burke as a ball striker, geez, he must be up there in the top few of the country. He's outrageous, eh? and he can really put it over from anywhere and needs needs so little space really to get his strike away, doesn't he? he? He either pushes into you and leans back, or he just leans back and he's able to create, he's able to generate such um, such momentum from very very little space as well. Yeah, like he's. 
couple of brilliant scores. There was one underneath the stand the other day. It was absolutely outrageous score. Um, um, you know, Dublin were probably holding on at the end, but they had been the better team throughout. Um, they had to been the better team throughout. They would have been really disappointed if they hadn't come away with the two points. So that kind of changes around their season a little bit and get, might give them the kickstart that they need now to really, really push on maybe. Who knows? Like They, they might really, really fancy them. They, they will fancy their chances of getting a result against either Kilkenny or Galway and potentially be, uh, securing a Leinster final place. Yeah, I, I definitely I'd say Liam Ryan is kicking himself this morning that he didn't have a pop. I'm not saying it was easy. I know it was the, the very end of the game, you're tired, but he is a very good player. So, you, mm. you, I mean, there's nothing worse than like, and I'd say this now playing snooker. This is obviously not the same thing. But what I, <laughs> but what I, I, know, I, know, I know exactly what you're going to say here. So towards the end of the frame, or, you know, if you're any position where you could win the frame by taking a pot on, knowing it could be costly yeah. if you miss, because you might leave a, a handy one for the opponent. I can never refuse, even if it's like less than a 50-50 chance or it's a long pot and obviously I'm useless, I can't refuse having the pop because I don't want to, you know, as they say, die wonder. Yeah, we always say it down the Bar Social Club and it gets down to those last four or five colours. Get busy living, get busy dying. God <laughs> damn right. And you always you I'd have say to take some on the selection pot. of apes down in that Bar Club. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I agree with you, Shane. I, that's what I was saying earlier. Take on the shot. Don't don't die wondering. Take on the shot. Take on the chance. Listen, if it goes wide, it goes wide. It was actually on Liam Ryan's right hand side as well. Like I just yeah. Ah, listen, we're not having a having a go at him. It's all in no. the heat at the moment. It's just he he probably will be disappointed himself that he didn't take it by the scruff of the neck and take the shot on. Yeah, and uh, props to my boy Sean Sean Brennan. Obviously, cool a goalkeeper. Played with him for many years. But making that penalty save, and you've already mentioned it, it was a brilliant save. And mm. they were talking on the Sunday game about how easily Wexford were able to walk out with the Dublin were able to walk out through Wexford with the sh short puckouts. And obviously, Owen O'Donnell's was showing up from early in the game where he just, I mean, he's a bull of a man when he's coming out with the ball and he knocked it over the bar brilliantly. And most people wouldn't think of him as, you know, like a Chris Perler. And he doesn't strike the ball that much, but anyone who would have seen his goal for Whitehall, Colin Kills last year, he was playing centre forward and blasted him into the top corner. You know, he he can strike the ball, but Sean Brennan, the way he fizzes out puck outs now, and I've seen this been talked about before, you know the way some people, some players, and Mark Fanning does it as well, they throw it up and sort of cut kind of across and mm. under the ball a little bit. Now when Sean, do, Sean does that, and he does it brilliantly, and gives you those sympathetic puck outs almost in, in stride, whereas you look at Tipperary against Watford, there was three or four puck outs that are hitting lads on the toes. That can't happen. Mm. And when Sean was a young player, like you knew straight away that he he had the skill set. But there was a couple of times when, you know, the puck out would come bouncing right in front of you. And I remember saying to him years ago, put it 10 yards over my yeah. head rather than at my toes. Um, yeah. But all his puck outs were perfectly, they were just handy for the defenders to walk out. And that's obviously something Mark, um, Matty Kenny works on as well in terms of like getting the puck out so players nearly taking it in stride. That's something we would have worked on over the years. But I am delighted for Sean because, you know, there's a lot of question marks over, you know, Alan Nolan being a very good goalkeeper as well. And Sean has had to wait in the wings for a long time. So I hope I'm not, um, you know, kind of putting any pressure or jinxing him or anything like that. But he's done very well and uh, very happy with how he went. And look at this now. What, what do you make of this comment? Shane split an image of Mark Selby. It's not the worst comparison I've ever had. Are you as miserable as him on a snooker table? That's the big question. I do love a dirty snooker. <laughs> I do love a dirty snooker. He do you take an hour and a half on every shot as well? I does study it a small bit, yeah. But then, you know, like any player who's relatively or massively amateur, now and again, you go full Quentin Han and just smash the balls around the place. <laughs> <laughs> Isaiah Sully 180 says, we'll have to get you down for a few frames sometime, Shane. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. The uh, only thing is, Shane, if you come into the Burr Social Club, it's it's like, a, it's like a cult almost. It's really easy to get into, impossible to get out of. You could be eight, <laughs> it could be 8 o'clock in the morning by the time you leave. You make it sound like the Mafia in the Godfather. <laughs> Ronan C, last week in Leinster with Kilkenny v Wexford, Dublin v Galway and Leash v Westmead could be very important games. Guaranteed. And Munster may not be. You know, mm. uh, I remember talking before with uh, Shane Brophy and Nina Guardian on Tipcast about how Cork v Tipperary could be playing for all the marbles the last day out. 
they might be playing for loads of no marbles. That they might be the way it goes. Could be playing for see who avoids playing Kerry in the in the um, Joe McDonough versus Bottom of Munster clash, the relegation promotion clash. You never know. Uh, Limerick and Wexford show how relevant league form is in contrasting ways. The last five minutes against uh, Galway papered over a lot of cracks. Hard to see them coming out of Leinster. Uh, will the week break suit uh, Waterford? Did either of you feel they got leggy towards the end of the game on Saturday? That's a that's an interesting question. Do I feel they got they failed to create chances? I definitely mm. know that their depth was showing up a little bit. I I think Ian Kenny not being available is is something that's really coming against them at the moment. I think he's a very good player. I did suspect Irla Daly would start that game, but I, there was a little bit of you know obviously it showed that Liam Cahill really wanted to win this game when he went down injured. And obviously he's trusted on what Ear the Daily told the physio and what the physio says and all that kind of stuff. But if you're thinking longer term thinking, you get Ear the Daily off the pitch there. Um, because if he's out for an extended period of time now, he's so important because he can mark most types of players because he's yeah. a very physical player. He come on against Tip, caught a brilliant ball. He's good in the air. He's quick across the ground. He's a big loss. But you know, I was surprised that Kartik Daly wasn't brought into the back line. He was brought in very late on into midfield. And look, there's obviously always reasons around these things. But I was surprised that he wasn't someone who was brought in because as you go down, dig into the depth and the panel of Waterford, I think some cracks are definitely beginning to appear. Yeah, no, I would I would agree with that Carrick Daly as well. I was surprised he didn't feature a bit more. Um, I think it's it was funny with Irla Daly uh, when one of the Waterford goals went in, they they panned to to the bench and you could see him trying to get up to celebrate, and he you'd see the pain he was visibly in as well. But um, yeah. Maybe maybe a bit of their depth showing up showing up a tiny bit as well. One of our viewers asked earlier, "What do we what do we think of the Waterford panel?" Do I still think the same thing? I have to say, my my views haven't changed that much, and I'll I'll say my I'll I'll leave my judgment until the until the end of the season. I still think there's a potential with all the players that are that are missing and potential suspensions and maybe black cards in games that they could yet be shown that their depth could yet be shown out in a big game. I'll I'll stand by that one. Would that be Limerick's most impressive win under John Kiley? The way they did it, to be down so many key players, to see Keane Lynch. Like, Keane Lynch is the best player in the country, right? So we're not debating that and deserve both of his hurlers in the year. But he's not actually playing at his very high level, the highest of his very high levels at the minute. I don't think we've seen that yet this year, either in Fitzgibbon Cup or in the, you know, for Limerick throughout the league and the championship. He's definitely carrying some sort of an injury. I, and the way he looked resigned on the bench like that, it looked to me like a player who had been carrying the injury. Yeah. He didn't even tog out against Dublin in a in a challenge match. I feel I feel like maybe he's been carrying an injury for quite a while, and that's why we're not seeing the very best of him. So to do it without such a key man, who had actually been he started the game okay now. I think that just makes it such an impressive win. Yeah, no, I'd agree with you. Um I as impressive victories go, I'd probably this wasn't actually a victory, but you're talking about results, shall we say. Probably the Cork draw in twenty eighteen. 14 men. Um, yeah, 14 men and probably the extra time win against Cork then the all Ireland semi-final. Um, probably going back to 2018, the Kilkenny win in the quarter-final was hugely impressive as well. Mm. Probably going back to one of those three games, I'd say, yeah, because there was a lot of adversity thrown at them the other day and they passed the test with flying colours and as we said earlier, the Waterford goals probably did camouflage a bit of, you know, they weren't really in that second half. They weren't no. in that last 20 or 25 minutes. Yeah, they were they were bossed out of the game, and um, even players like Ty De Borca, he was again he's not having an absolutely amazing season just at the moment. Player we rate massively, so we're not writing anybody off. But like he was taken off, I thought that was strange. Which maybe they did sw swap his position around a little bit, but I thought it was strange to take him off. Yeah, no, it was definitely a strange one because you you see him as the the linchpin of not only the defense but the linchpin of the whole team. Um, Maybe you know potentially that them. Maybe potentially in game they might have to look at him somewhere else. Maybe if they want to uh, get him to as much exert as much of an influence as possible. Maybe a team like Limerick. Um, well, he'd say probably Tipperary not exposed him, but exposed potentially the space that he leaves. And Limerick maybe did something similar the other day as well. So I'd say they'll probably be looking at potentially another option for where they could use him at their best if they meet Limerick again. Yeah, in the first half, like Limerick didn't create that much, but their scoring efficiency was huge. They scored 14 out of 18 chances. Watford, this is probably where they left it behind them a little bit. 
they went in a point down having been 13 11 ahead yeah. just before you were heading towards injury time um they only converted 13 to 22 they're they were shooting from 100 yards at times i kind of mentioned you know a cornerback taking a couple of shots late on in the game the last day when feed it into desi for once he's uh he's really really on top of sean finn here keep feeding him the ball let him add to his five but like their forwards just scored two from play in the first half that was ozzy gleason and desi hutchinson whereas limericks had seven now then in the second half they like limerick just hit overdrive they created 29 chances in the second half and in the total game watford had 38 so that just tells you how yeah. dominant they were in the second half like the hooks blocks and tackles stats that were on sky sports after 52 minutes was 50 to 37. So they just ground down the data, really. So it might feel like Watford have closed the gap somewhat because they lost their last two championship games by 11 points each to them. But I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know. I feel like they probably have narrowed the gap a little bit, but... I think seven or eight, Shane. Seven or eight, I would say, is probably more realistic, I'd say. You know? Yeah, you kind of took the words on my mouth. Joe LK120 says, Shane, if Wexford beat Kilkenny, Galway beat Kilkenny, and Kilkenny beat Dublin, then Dublin are out. Everything to play for, fair point. That is a true point. Uh, ML89, realistically, if Watford can't beat Limerick, minus all the names, they're down. Will they ever? This was the closest they've gotten by a good bit, and they can't get within striking distance of a win. Um, okay, so let's move on to the, the Joe McDonough Cup. Carlo uh, got, uh, well, was it Carlo? Is that the right result there? Sorry, no, we're, we're just yeah, straight no, over no, so is, many yeah. games. Yeah, it was Carlo, 15, Carlo 15 points, Kerry 321, and that was in Dr. Cullen Park after Carlo hitting 430 the week previous against that's, me. That's why I thought this has to be a mistake yeah. because, you know, I mean, we're trying to cover so many games, as you can imagine. The odd one, we don't get a chance to look in depth into everything. Yeah. I was like, that has to be a typo. No, it's a, a really kind of mad result, to be honest with you, because I thought, I actually mentioned last Monday that Carlo were probably the team that weren't being talked about uh, in the McDonough Cup, and they're obviously the first winners of the McDonough Cup in, what was it, in, in 2018. Um, so that's a really disappointing result. Parik Boyle hit 1-11, 1-2 from play. Shane Conway hit 1-2 from play. Niall McCatty 1-2 from play. Big win for them, especially after being, being beaten by, by down first time out uh, on home soil. Uh, Mead, it's funny the way its form doesn't seem to work out. Like Mead were annihilated the first day on home soil and kind of put it up to awfully to some respect at the weekend. It was awfully 222, Mead 19 points. Um, there was a really weird, uh, not weird, but it was just you know, the throw, the throw hand pass has been clamped down on now. There were 12 frees for throw hand passes in that game. Um, I wasn't at the game, but by all accounts, anybody that was there, they just said it was so stop start, so stop start, so frustrating as well. So this is a clear indication of um, a referee who's going to the letter of law on this, and then maybe other others aren't. There, but there were a couple of um, there were a couple of even in the Clare and Watford game or Clare and Tip game yesterday where you think ah that that does look like a throw and people are looking for the free now and when it's not given there is a bit of uproar but it does look like they were they were totally clamped down on in in the Offaly Me game uh, unless everybody's on the same hymn sheet that won't work. Yeah. I don't. I'm happy enough to see referees policing this. It was it was called back a few times in the Watford Limerick game. If I want to be a bit sore about the Watford Tipperary game, you could say that Patrick Curran looked like he really did throw that ball to to Mikey Kiley as well. So I've no problem with clamping down, but you're not going to get consistency across the board. It's just not going to happen. So we, there's probably no point in being frustrated with, well, this referee did that, this did that. Everyone's got their own style of refereeing, but I am happy to see it being in the main clamp down. And I got a we got a message in on the Our Game YouTube channel about this and um it, i think it was hugh walsh was his name he said should a thrown pass result in a clash ball instead of a free that was basically the essence of what he was saying is it too costly that if, if you're blown for what might be a marginal call of a of a throw for that to more or less just be a point straight over the bar because most teams have have good free takers so should it just be a clash ball do you reckon i think uh the word you used there that would make it viable was marginal it is such a marginal call and like the referee does not know 100%. They do not know. If you slow it down on TV, you might potentially be able to see the, you know, the movement or the action and be able to prove that it, that it wasn't a throw. But it is a really, really marginal call. You're making a gut instinct call. Should you be punished with, you know, it's a lot of the time it's a pop pass when the team could be gone if it's not called. Should you be punished with potentially a point at the other end? 
it would I'll be tell you the, what, yeah, right. I, I yeah. remember um it was for the Burris Junior team, probably around oh four or five, something like that, playing in um and I think it was a North semi final. But this will tell you it still annoys me a little bit that towards the end of the game we were looking for um an equalizer, I think it was Noxigauna, and somebody was pulling out of me and they full on swung me around while I had the ball, but I popped it off to somebody, and it was one of those ones where like I definitely made an attempt but it was probably one of those ones where at times it can be imperceptible the whole the striking action or whatever and the the referee instead of giving me the free for being pulled gave me a free give a free against me for showing the ball and they went up and i think they scored pretty much straight away then but we should have had a chance for an equalizer so that's where mm. like that that was to me, like that one hurt, and I can still remember it now. I mean, it doesn't hurt me now, but it's it annoyed me. At the ah, time. it does. It does a bit. I that doesn't it hurt. Does it, it's annoying. Though. It's really annoying because you go away from a game then, and people are thinking, "Oh, Jason, if you hadn't to throw the ball there, you know, we might have won the game." Mm. But you know, you can't say for certain. It's it was so marginal, and it was and it was being fouled anyway, as I might have mentioned <laughs> twice already. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's why I think it's it's a bit frustrating. But you can't get rid of a situation where. Let's say you and I are defending on the same team and we hold the lad up brilliantly and he tries to do the hand pass out over the top which and but doesn't quite connect properly and it is a bit of a throw. We should be rewarded with a free for that and not just a clash ball. So that's why I think it would be unfair to completely get rid of it. It's a difficult one, isn't it? If it's a, I, I kind of agree with you and then I'm thinking, if it's a foul, it's a foul. You know what I mean? It's mm. why why should that be a throw in and nothing else in the rule book uh, would be a throw in when you make a foul? But I think on the, on those marginal ones, like would it be totally wrong for you know if a referee thinks that that is after throwing is, is after throwing the ball, and uh, but they're not one hundred percent certain to give a throw in. I, I I don't know. It's it 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 would definitely be a grey area, but it, it's it's a difficult one. It really is a difficult one. Just going through some of the other games, Shane. There, um, sorry, can we, I just give you a couple of yeah. comments here before you do? Yeah, and we'll yeah. jump into them. Then uh, Andrew says that would surely lead to fellas throwing the ball more, taking the chance. That yeah, it's only a clash ball. That's true. Does a clash ball lead to more rocks and um, a slower game? Richard Hogan, a bit like last year's semi final. Waterford missed chances at crucial stages. Daily going off Brock Allen into the game. Watford just couldn't make any inroads in the second half. Some hooked by Tom Barron and Cahill O'Neill. By the way, Irla Daly was pulled for a free early in the game, and it really was not a free. This was off the ball on Galan. And when I saw the replay, I just definitely didn't think so. Galan not getting an All Star last year. What a joke. The 2021 All Star team was 12 Limerick players, and not to pick the best man. Galan definitely not getting applauded better than Lynch. Okay, so that's his opinion. Go ahead, take away the. It's, fu it's funny, Philly Phil McMahon uh, wrote an independent the other day, but he basically thinks he didn't get footballer of the year because he was a maybe a controversial player who played on the edge. Galan would you'd say play on the plays on the edge a little bit, and maybe some of the some of the maybe strokes that he pulls or that maybe doesn't. Uh, he doesn't lean himself to getting some awards. Maybe potentially, you know, I honestly think that. When we picked our team of the year, he wasn't in ours, so I, I, I'd stand, I'd stand by that. But just flying back through a couple of quick results there, uh, our man, our Antrim won the Battle of Ulster up in Ballycran, six twenty two to Downs three sixteen. Uh, Conal Cunning with ten points, a freeze. Kieran Clark got two one, and Sean Elliott ended up with two one as well. Then in the Christie Ring Cup, massive win for Sligo over Wicklow, four twenty four to one fourteen. Um, I don't know. Wicklow have really gone to the dogs since uh, that Verney fella stopped playing with them. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, Wicklow have have a took a, a big big nose dive in recent years. They wouldn't have wouldn't have seen something like that as even possible a couple of years ago. Big win for Kildare over Derry, one twenty four to twelve points. That's a huge win. Kind of. It really puts them in poor position there. Uh, a good win for Mayo as well over in Rice Slip, 122 to London's 213. In the Nicky Rackard Cup, Donegal 122, uh, Roscommon 316, that's a draw. Tyrone 317, Armagh 115. I only found out that Sambo McNaughton had taken over of, of Armagh in uh, in recent weeks, um, but they were beaten at the weekend. Big win for Fermanagh, 223 to Warwickshire's 25. And in the Laurie Mara Cup, a tight win for Longford, 116 to Louds, 115. Another a tight win for Lancaster as well, 17 points to 113. Big shout out to uh, Connor Kennedy of Offaly there, who made his debut for Lancaster off the bench. Sir Kieran Mann. And uh, last game in the Laurie Mara Cup, it was Monaghan 218, Leitrim 116. Some amount of games over uh, another another mad busy weekend. 
It absolutely was. So probably something slipped through the cracks here and there. So please let us know in the comments. We'll obviously be back for Thursday's show, which is uh, only available at patreon.com forward slash our game. As we said before, please do feel free to support the independent media and help drive the channel on to the next uh, level as well. Also brought to you by Patre or by orgaretro.com. If you want to get one of these brilliant jerseys here, any of the ones that are on screen there, go to orgaretro.com, use the promo code OURGAME and you'll get 15% off. Michael, thank you very much. We'll catch you again. Cheers, Jen.